الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين نرحب بالجميع في جلسة اليوم بعنوان الطب في مواجهة الفيروسات نظرا لطبيعة المادة العلمية فهذه الجلسة بالكامل ستترجم إلى العربية وتنقل عن طريق اليوتيوب الرابط سوف يوجد في حساب التعليم العالي تويتر uh, So now we can start So hello everyone uh, I would like to welcome our uh, outstanding uh, distinguished speakers as well as our audience to today's session entitled uh, Medicine Facing uh, um, Against uh, Viruses. So uh, we know that the current situation, we have over 55 million of COVID cases worldwide and most of the countries facing uh, the second wave. And uh, also we have our own current flavor of uh, Corona, which is MERS. And uh, worldwide, there's more than 1,000 trial of uh, between management and um, uh, preventive strategy to fight uh, uh, COVID. Uh, in light of that, it's very important to have such events uh, organized um, in scientific um, fashion. So by this, without further ado, I would like to introduce our um, excellent, outstanding speakers. So first we have uh, we're going to start. Uh, I will introduce all of our speakers. So uh, at first, so we have Prof. Ahmed Al Askar. Prof. Al Askar is a consultant adult hematology and stem cell transplant at King um, uh, Abdulaziz Medical City, Ministry of National Guard Hospitals. Also, we have Prof. Uh, Yasin Arabi. But Prof. Arabi is professor and chairman of intensive care department, King of Abdulaziz Medical City. Uh, also, we have uh, Dr. Mohammed uh, Boussaid, he's a consultant of infectious disease, King Abdulaziz Medical City, Riyadh. Uh, we have Dr. Walid Abbas Zahir, who is a, a chief researcher officer of G42 Healthcare Vaccination uh, Project Director uh, and consultant of regenerative medicine. And also, finally, uh, last but not least, we have Professor Fahad Abdullah Zamil, he's a professor of pediatric and pediatric infectious diseases. College of King uh, Saud University Medical City. So, and we're going to start our first talk now by uh, Prof. Al Asker. Um, the title of his talk is Medical Research and Charting of Path of for uh, Medicine. So, please, Prof. Al Asker, go ahead. You have 15 minutes. Prof. Al Asker, I think you're muted. Yes. No. All right. It's uh, really, uh, Yes. Yes, I can hear you clearly. شكرا دكتورة مها على الانترودكشن وشكرا لل للمنظمين الحقيقة في وزارة التعليم وعلى هذا الملتقى الجميل الحقيقة. Um, I'm pleased to, to uh, be part of this uh, elite group uh, to talk about uh, medicine against uh, viruses. Um, uh, my talk will focus on um, uh, medical research and charting a path for medicine. Um, so, Professor, can you put your share up your slide, please? Yep. Um, yes, we can see it now. Perfect. Um, so, I will start. Uh, Rahim. Um, so, I'm talking. I'm going to talk about uh, overview um, of the importance of medical research uh, in general and um, and its impact on medicine. Um, so, the title is "Medical Research and Charting a Path for Medicine," um, uh, and. Um, Allow me sometimes to speak in Arabic because I know some of the audience also are non-English speakers. Um, so sometimes I might switch to Arabic. Um, so this is um, this is how we uh, look at medical research uh, as researchers. So which first of all, um, in this slide, as you see, how medical research leading to medical practice. Um, and whether the medical practice is the one leading to research. Um, it's very important to understand uh, how medicine is formed. So what is medicine? Medicine is generally um, measures and general practices that are proven by um, evidence. So evidence-based medicine, what makes medicine? Now, when you do 
medicine that's not evidence-based, um, it would not be classified as medicine. It would be classified as probably alternative medicine. So once you prove uh, by the scientific evidence that this is effective measure and safe measure, then it's get included in medicine. So, so generally speaking, we uh, shape up medicine by uh, through medical research. So, and medical research usually takes years. So if you look at the slide, I don't know if you see the mouse moving or not. Um, can you see it? Yes, Prof, we can. Okay, perfect. So medical research takes years and, and, and we call it here research and development. So it's very important uh, to use the, um, the terminology development because we're developing new measures, we're developing new products that impact the medical practice. Now, once we have a product, and if we take COVID-19 as example, it's a new virus, it's a new disease uh, that um, we know nothing about. Um, we know the, let's, we call it with the sister viruses and the class of viruses. However, it's a disease that came up. We didn't know what virus has caused it. And we started to learn about it. Now, this is what we call, this is where we, we're at here before, the, we, before we shape up the medical practice again as the COVID-19. Now, once, and we are in the process now, once we assess our practices and assess our measures and develop our products and subject it to uh, testing and clinical trials, we call it, then it will make the medical practice again as the COVID-19. Um, if you noticed, when COVID-19 started, um, at the, at the um, onset of the uh, pandemic, the mortality was high in uh, all over the world. Now the mortality is much less. And that's thanks to, again, our, um, you know, uh, several attempts and testing and uh, practices that were subjected uh, to, uh, clinical, to uh, clinical testing and clinical trials uh, that led us to, uh, uh, you know, improve our uh, dealing with the virus and how we treat the virus in general. Um, and I will come to that uh, in a minute as well. And then once we form the medical practice, there is still part of it, um, there is still part of the medical research that will have to take place. So that's needed again. That's a, a medical research that after you shape up the medical, uh, after you form the medical practice or the medicine, then you need to improve that medicine further. And then uh, you subject it again to further clinical trials and testing and others. Uh, so, and then the medical learning starts as well, the medical learning process. So people will learn about the, the COVID-19 and how is it treated and et cetera. So this is, uh, how I, um, you know, explain this uh, slide. So medical research basically leads to uh, medicine. Um, now, uh, focusing on the part, the R&D journey, that's, that leads to the new medicine. Very important. Uh, these are these components, as you see, the high quality research uh, leads to development of new products. And then you need to deploy that product and, and that will impact the clinical practice and um, it might, uh, and leads to the commercialization of that product and et cetera. For example, if you have a new medicine or you have a new vaccine, uh, then it will be uh, commercialized. This series basically from high quality research, each component is very uh, sophisticated, very complex, needs specialized people, need experts, uh, to deal with each of these components. And it's not easy to have all of these components in one place or one center. So there has to be a collaboration between various uh, medical research centers, various industry, various companies, um, government, et cetera, that will drive um, the process uh, to impact either the economy through commercialization of products or the health uh, of individuals uh, and health policies. So 
taking COVID-19 again as example, um, as I said, it's a disease um, six months or eight months ago, we did not know much about. Um, and then, so we have to form knowledge about the disease. Now, in any disease, you need to know the, we, we, we aim to develop a knowledge about epidemiology of the of the of the disease epidemiology we're talking about how it's formed how is it spread how how past how virulent the, the virus how aggressive um and then uh, so you need that kind of research in the um in the field um screening and etc and then you will at the same time you will develop new diagnostic tools uh, new tests, how we, how we test the virus, etc., and you will develop at the same time also new medicine. You will test initially the the, the drugs that's available. We call it repurposing. So you want to um, uh, to test a drug that the, the available, for example, antiviral medications for other viruses. You want to see if that works against this virus, and that will be subjected again to testing and clinical trials, as we call it. And then you will develop preventive measures, and we did actually with the virus when we wear the mask and when we have we practice social distancing and etc. The uh, the lockdown and etc. So that's again these are preventive measures uh, to minimize the impact of the virus. And uh, we're doing a number of clinical trials, uh, as I said, whether on diagnostic tests or in therapeutics or in vaccines that's being developed. Um, and this again will shape up the medicine that will be used again to, to combat the virus. Now, these goals on the left side um, requires tools. So on the right side are the tools that's needed to achieve those goals. You need basic uh, science research. You need um, whole genome sequencing to identify the virus. That's how we identify the virus as a new. Uh, and, that, and that's how I de we identify the virus a class. Uh, it's among the coronavirus, etc. And then we keep doing this whole genome sequencing. Um, and then we try to learn about the immunology that's induced in the host, how the host or, um, who is uh, infected by the virus um, 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 deal with the virus, etc. What's the immunology uh, profile? And um, we also um, are supposed to have bioinformatics, artificial intelligence that will help us again, again to assess what, what proteins that are sensitive in the virus that could be used uh, to be targeted by therapeutics um, and develop vaccine against um, drug discovery, uh, vaccine developments, and clinical trials. Now, luckily, um, this is, if you want to develop these or achieve these goals, it will take you many years. So how did we reach that past in COVID-19 in reaching uh, development of a vaccine? You know, um, usually vaccine will take, again, 10 to 20 years to develop. What happened basically is that the knowledge that we accumulated again is previous viruses, including the uh, SARS-1 and including the MERS uh, corona, that helped us in cutting the, sh uh, you know, the, the road short, basically, to achieve these goals. So already we knew about the spike protein, for example, and the previous coronavirus. So that spike protein, we found it in the a new, a new COVID-19 on the SARS-2. And then we start targeting it and, and developing these uh, drugs. So, um, so, so as I said, we had an experience with the MERS-CoV, especially in our country in Saudi Arabia. And we um, worked hard uh, when the epidemic hits uh, Saudi Arabia with MERS. Um, and that um, led, again, accumulation of the knowledge and accumulation of the practice and the clinical trials, um, and we developed the vaccine against MERS-CoV in collaboration with Oxford um, here in Saudi Arabia. And uh, we subjected uh, that vaccine and also some therapeutics uh, medicine 
uh, two clinical trials and uh, ended up again, uh, you know, passing through um, the the initial stage of the lab to the preclinical, we call the animal and the translational research, and reaching to um, uh, human research, which is the clinical trial. Uh, so we have concluded phase one clinical trial for MERS uh, vaccine. We have concluded recently and published in, in New England Journal of Medicine, and probably Dr. Yasin Arabi will talk about uh, one of the therapeutics uh, against MERS. Well, uh, you have two minutes. Okay, I'm almost done actually. Um, I have two slides. So this is basically again summarize how research is driven. So basically, we have to invest in basic research. Um, we have to invest in basic research because not all research will lead to products. So you need basic research in order to uh, go through translation and clinical trials, again, to affect uh, uh, medical practice. The industry trials is very important and we're trying to attract uh, pharmaceutical, pharma industry trials in the kingdom to participate in clinical trials. So that's uh, here, this is my uh, last slide, which is again, what we have at KMARC in terms of research for uh, COVID-19 projects. We have more than 150 research projects um, uh, that um, uh, basically produced so far more than eight uh, patent applications, more than 150 publications so far. And the, the research is still going. Actually, the mega projects are still going. Um, these are uh, kind of uh, uh, goals that we're trying to achieve by these uh, uh, medical pro uh, research projects. Um, research that's uh, related to the virus and research that's related to the host um, and um, others like clinical trials, uh, biobanking of samples, developing diagnostic tests, uh, etc. So that concludes my uh, talk and I'll be happy to answer questions. At the, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Lasker. You just finished just on time. Mashallah, tabarak Allah. Uh, we will take the uh, all the questions at the end of the session, so we can have the time to take from the audience uh, all the questions. So, by in, uh, our second speaker will be Prof. Uh, Yasin Arabi. Um, his title of his talk will be "Advanced Immersed Therapeutic and Application for COVID." So, please, um, Dr. Uh, Prof. Uh, Arabi, uh, join us. Put your slides up, please. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to be part of this uh, important event. And uh, it's uh, great to see all these efforts uh, put together. Um, my talk about um, update on MERS COVID therapeutics and implications for COVID-19 really comes nicely um, after uh, the great presentation by Dr. Ahmed Laskar. And uh, as an example of a clinical trial conducted uh, in Saudi uh, hospitals, to look at for uh, therapeutics. So I'm going to start with giving a brief epidemiology of MERS and then uh, as an introduction of the trial that I'm presenting, which is called Miracle Trial. I'll talk about the background uh, of the interferon response to mers cov and then um, I'll touch on the possible implications for COVID-19. So uh, this trial has been just published uh, last month in the New England Journal of Medicine of uh, interferon beta 1b and lupinavir ritonavir for the Middle East respiratory uh, syndrome. So MERS-CoV started uh, in 2012 and since then we had uh, 2,500 uh, cases almost uh, with 850 deaths uh, with a high case fatality rate around 34%. 85% of the cases happened in Saudi Arabia. Generally the trend um, uh, has been coming down, uh, which is a very good thing. But the disease is a severe disease and associated with severe, mor uh, with high morbidity and mortality. It causes uh, respiratory infection and ARDS, but it is a multi-organ disease. These patients develop acute kidney injury, um, uh, develop the shock, uh, hematologic involvement, and GI involvement. As you know, the disease. Uh, uh, is thought to be uh, uh, coming from animals as the reservoir, but a transmission from humans and within healthcare facilities are well-known causes for, for the infection. 
Now, MERS is associated with high mortality. Among those patients who I see in my ICU, the mortality is around 67%, so that's very high mortality. Um, and if you compare this with non-MERS severe acute respiratory infection, uh, definitely much higher, there's uh, 35%. And uh, I just put as a comparison the mortality from COVID-19 from our um, ICU, it's around 25%. So there are similarities to COVID-19, but MERS remains um, a really bad disease, much more severe uh, than other forms of uh, respiratory infections. Now, the rationale for our trial was based on uh, preclinical studies showing that interferon is an important part of the uh, human response to MERS-CoV infection. And in fact, in vitro, interferon alpha and interferon beta have inhibitory effect on MERS-CoV. Interestingly, uh, MERS-CoV, the virus, appears to be more sensitive than SARS-CoV-1 to interferon effect. We don't know if it's more sensitive than SARS-CoV-2, but it's more sensitive than SARS-CoV-1. Um, on the other hand, which is really uh, amazing, is that the virus inhibits interferon response. So the virus um, inhibits the defense mechanism that enable uh, killing the virus, uh, which is really interesting. Um, and among all the interferons, it appeared that interferon beta has the strongest inhibition for MERS-CoV. There's uh, an animal study uh, that looked at interferon beta 1b and lupinivir ritonivir, and also mecophenolate in marmoset model with MERS, and showed that the animals that were treated with interferon beta and lupinivir uh, had significant improvement compared to the control animals, uh, but not the mycophenolate um, uh, treated animals. So um, it appears based on preclinical data that interferon beta and lupinivir uh, might be effective. So that based on this, we planned this trial um, called the miracle trial to investigate the efficacy of combination of interferon beta 1b and lupinivir, ritonivir compared to placebo on 90 day uh, all cause mortality in hospitalized patients with, with uh, laboratory confirmed MERS. Uh, we have a study protocol that was published ahead of the final results and also statistical analysis plan also published uh, as well. Some of the challenges for doing a trial with MERS uh, were uh, obvious from the beginning. First of all, there's no enough information about the effect size of lupinivir and ritonivir um, and interferon beta. And this type of information you needed to be able to adequately calculate the sample size. So this information doesn't exist. So when we planned the trial, we had to make some assumptions that I'm gonna come to. In addition, um, and when you don't have, you don't know the effect size, you would normally do a pilot study to see what might the effect might be and use this in doing a larger trial. But for MERS, this is difficult because the number of cases already rare, is a rare disease. So if you do a pilot study, the information from the pilot study is not used effectively in answering the question. And therefore, we plan the trial as something called a recursive two-stage group sequential RCT, where the trial is started with the stage one and the information from the stage one and the interim analysis is used to recalculate the sample size and add additional stages if needed at different interim analyses. Um, so it's an adaptive design um, with multiple stages. We plan the trial to be multi-center and as you would expect, for MERS is the only way to do a clinical trial because the disease happens in many sites and, and generally low rates. So you need to enroll multi-center. So it was a really good thing to do it as a multi-center trial. We plan the trial to be double blind, uh, randomized control trial, and blinding is very important in this type of study, especially when the sample size is small to reduce confounding. We, random, we stratified randomization based on center and based on whether, whether the patient was on mechanical ventilation at the time of enrollment. We use concealed randomization 
and uh, we use a pragmatic approach to the trial where the interventions were at the discretion of the treating teams. We included in the trial patients who were 18 year old or, or older um, who have been confirmed to have mers cov and have some abnormality, some organ dysfunction that is judged to be related to mers cov so such as hypoxia, hypotension, etc. The idea is we did not want to include asymptomatic patients or patients who might be in the hospital just for infection control purposes. We want to include symptomatic patients with MERS. So patients with mers cov who are eligible were randomized to receive lupinavir, ritonavir, 400 milligram, uh, 100 milligram twice daily as tablet or suspension. And uh, this is for 14 days plus interferon beta 1b given subcutaneously every other day, also for a total of seven doses, i.e. 14 days. The, the control group received a placebo tablet um, or syrup and injection um, placebo, normal saline, uh, for the same duration of time. The primary endpoint of the trial was 90-day uh, outcome, 90-day mortality. The trial was proposed uh, in 2015. Um, we put it together and we submitted for approvals, uh, which we uh, received all the approvals from, um, from uh, KMARC, from Minister of Health, and the registration in Saudi FD in 2016. And by the end of 2016, we started enrolling patients. Um, in the, um, in the, the line refers to the number of patients who were enrolled in the trial. The bar refer, uh, referred to the number of sites enrolled over the period of time. In gray are the uh, sites that were um, had approval and were able to enroll patients. And the green, the sites that have approval but did not have patients uh, during the study period. So as you expect, this is a disease that was not common after 2016, but we were able to enroll patients progressively with the great help from our colleagues in different teams. In 2018, we start to send a mobile research team to sites to initiate uh, the trial. And the first interim analysis was conducted in 2019, and that uh, led to re, uh, sample size recalculation at 114, and uh, they uh, told us to continue with the trial. In 2020, because of the COVID-19, the DSMB called for unplanned uh, interim analysis that I'm gonna talk about. This trial was uh, sponsored by King Abdullah International Medical Research Center, and big thanks to uh, uh, the uh, KMARC uh, with all uh, leadership with Dr. Ahmed Laskar and many, many departments in the, in the research center who have been instru instrumental in uh, getting this trial uh, through. It was not, it's, this is a complex trial um, because of the multi-center, the rare events. Um, so it was really amazing. So this is the sites in different uh, cities. We have five cities participated, nine sites in total. And you can see on the left, the graph of patients, percentage of patients who were screened out of hospitalized patients. So in 2020, actually, we were able to enroll almost 67% uh, of all diagnosed patients uh, who meet the eligibility criteria in Saudi Arabia. We, we created a very efficient uh, screening system for uh, MERS, which was uh, important to get to the sample size. So in, uh, as I said, in um, in March 2020, the DSMB called for unplanned interim analysis. And this un unplanned interim analysis um, the, um, was uh, uh, conducted, and the statistician, the DSMB statistician, calculated the conditional power to be 82%, which exceeded the planned power of 80%. Also, the statistician found that the treatment effect never crossed the stopping futility boundaries. A point two in both interim analyses, and uh, also observed that the effect size was consistent in both interim analyses favoring the treatment. As a result, the DSMB recommended that the trial terminate uh, subject enrollment and proceed with reporting results. 
So we assess for eligibility total of 182 hospitalized patients with MERS. Uh, we found 124 of them would be eligible. Uh, the patients for reason for not including patients are here in this box. Out of this, we managed to enroll uh, to, to randomize 96 patients. There are some patients who were not enrolled for reasons uh, mentioned in this box. And uh, eventually, you have 43 patients in the uh, lipinavir, retinavir, um, uh, in the intention to treat analysis, and in the 52 in the placebo uh, uh, for the primary outcome analysis. So the two groups were very similar in age. Median was around 56. Uh, the similar um, male around kind of two thirds of the patients, a little bit more. Uh, Apache was around 20 in both groups. So far as six, Karnofsky performance score was similar in the two groups. Uh, around one third of the patients were on the ward and two thirds were in the ICU at the enrollment time, 40% um, were mechanically ventilated at the time of enrollment and other organ uh, support um, sis, uh, uh, are shown in here and they were similar at the time of enrollment. Yes, you have two minutes. Okay, the primary outcome of the trial was death and the trial showed reduction, almost 50% reduction in the 90 day mortality uh, with the treatment. This is the kepler meyer curve showing lower mortality or higher survival in the intervention group compared to placebo. This is an important slide because it shows the subgroup analyses which were defined a priori, and uh, it showed that the patients were treated within seven days of onset, had significant reduction mortality, almost 80% reduction mortality, um, but not the patients who were treated late. There was no difference. And the, the p-value for interaction was very, very low, suggesting that this is a true heterogeneity in treatment effect. I'm gonna move on to the implications for uh, COVID-19. Uh, there have been several trials looking at lupinavir, retinavir. The recovery is probably the most uh, recently fully published one, uh, showed no difference when you used lupinavir as a monotherapy for COVID-19. Uh, interferon uh, also has a preclinical evidence uh, we have, there are two papers in science published recently that there are defects in interferon in COVID patients with severe disease. And there have been several, pay, several studies that suggested benefit with interferon. Unfortunately, the solidarity trial did not show benefit with interferon. So I think the question remains open. There's just a trial just published uh, in Lancet Respiratory showed that inhaled interferon in um, COVID-19 was beneficial. So our trial was adaptive design, pragmatic trial. We followed patients to 90 day. All these are strength for the trial. Some weaknesses um, really, really not were not avoidable. Early termination, and I explained that termination was because of a reason and based on power calculation. Uh, and we, uh, I think we calculated that even if we reach a sample size 114, would not have uh, changed the outcome of the trial. So in conclusion, our study showed that the combination of interferon beta and lupinavir reduced mortality in MERS requiring hospital admission. And the effect was greatest when the treatment started within seven days. Again, big thanks to KMARC, sponsor of the trial and for all their support all along for the study and all the studies over MERS and currently COVID and all my colleagues from uh, all the hospitals who done a really remarkable job pulling this uh, study together. And thank you very much. Thank you, Bro Farabi, uh, just on time. Thank you very much. And now we move to the third, uh, our third speaker, uh, Dr. Mohammed Boussaid. Uh, title of his talk would be Role of Clinical Trial During Pandemic. So please go ahead, Dr. Mohammed, and share your slide. Dr. Mohammed, you're on mute. Hey, Dr. Mohammed, we can yes, hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, Dr. Maha. 
I would like first to thank the organizing committee and uh, the Ministry of Education uh, for this great uh, forum, and I'm really delighted to be part of this. Uh, um, it's not easy to come after uh, both Aska and both Yassin, but I'll try to do my best, inshallah, to uh, present something uh, beneficial. So, uh, basically, I'm going to talk about the role of clinical trials during the pandemic. And uh, uh, just to go through uh, that. So, these are my objectives. Uh, and I'm trying to go through the effect of the pandemic itself on the clinical trials and then uh, COVID-19 clinical trials and we'll go through some uh, examples and then if we have any national projects in, in terms of clinical trials and uh, how can we improve uh, these uh, type of uh, research. So early in, in the pandemic when, when it was started uh, there was a lot of concerns worldwide about the ongoing uh, clinical trials, uh, uh, cancer uh, clinical trials, other very important clinical trials for patients that might affect their mortality and morbidity. Uh, so at that time, it was all over the news that uh, this might be uh, affected. And uh, uh, the concern was mainly about uh, the patient themselves, if they are going to miss uh, their visits, if they are going to get actually COVID-19 uh, infection, about the missing data and the integrity uh, of these uh, clinical trials. Uh, so, uh, also there were, uh, there were concerns about the safety uh, of the patients and uh, the issue of the logistics, especially when there is a lockdown and there is uh, inability to, uh, to uh, provide medications and the study medications for the patient. So, uh, uh, the US uh, FDA has uh, actually uh, had a uh, couple of announcements and guidance uh, for researchers and trialists and sponsors uh, to assure that there is uh, uh, safety measures that they need to follow and also to maintain compliance with uh, GCB. Uh, their concern was mainly about the trial integrity and they want to ensure that the patients and the study data are safe and they are going to have uh, uh, everything with adherence to the protocol uh, procedures. So basically that's about the clinical trial that was ongoing. But let's move to COVID-19 clinical trials. So again, early when COVID-19 became an, an international emergency, there, was, like, there were a lot of uh, medication that were uh, uh, introduced as a possible uh, treatment for COVID-19. And if you can see here, there's a lot of uh, medications that people started using it either in trials or off trials and of course uh, off uh, label. So all of these medications to reach um, a good evidence, it needs to be part of a clinical trial. And using any of these medications uh, off label and off trials, it's considered as a missed uh, opportunity uh, to know and to provide uh, an evidence uh, of the most and uh, uh, the most safe and effective uh, medication for COVID-19. If you can see here, there's a lot of antivirals and a lot of uh, immunomodulators and anti-inflammatory. So basically, there was a lot of uh, clinical trials that were that were launched over all the world, in, in, in North America, in Europe, and in China initially. And these uh, uh, researchers were trying to work at the record to, to, to find the best way to treat COVID-19 and uh, to repurposing because uh, it's really difficult to find and make a new uh, drug for that. So actually what we are doing, we are using an, an existing medication uh, and repurposing it for uh, COVID-19. Now, uh, uh, mo uh, most of these trials, uh, we have a lot of uh, single center trials, a lot of small trials. But the exception here was mainly the large uh, two trials of recovery, solidarity, and also it's worth mentioning the ACT trial and discovery. Uh, also, there is RIMAPCAP and a couple of multi center international uh, clinical trials. But but the single center uh, clinical trial has faced a lot of obstacles. Most of those uh, failed to reach uh, a good number of recruitment 
or at least to reach an answer for these uh, questions. So, uh, as, as we are speaking, we have at least these medications under uh, clinical trials. And if you can see now, they have more antivirals, more and more immunomodulators, actually, especially after the result of dexamethasone. And then also we have any other medication like anticoagulation and some uh, supplementals. Now, uh, the first example here is, is remdesivir. And uh, theoretically, actually, uh, we thought that uh, remdesivir in vitro might be effective against uh, COVID-19 because it's a uh, result in uh, coronaviruses in general. So there is multiple clinical trials in the States and also Solidarity internationally has uh, uh, implemented one arm for remdesivir. And actually, it did not show much of a uh, significant result. The only positive result was from ACT trial, which showed maybe it might shorten the time to recovery. There is some controversy, but most of the big trials have shown that it might not be effective. But I will, take you, I, will, I will talk mainly about this new medication. I think you might remember when uh, uh, early in COVID-19 pandemic, when people were talking about this anti-malaria medication that might be uh, useful for uh, COVID-19. And that was based actually in case reports, small clinical trials, especially one came from France, and then it was supported by multiple cohort uh, studies. But we needed a clinical trial to see if it is really effective or not. And actually, this is what happened. So a recovery trial and solidarity trial has published the data showing that there is no significant improvement of the clinical status or the mortality at uh, uh, four weeks after starting the medications. So uh, actually, this is a medication that we thought that it might be uh, uh, useful for COVID-19, but eventually we found out that after good uh, uh, multicenter uh, paradigmatic uh, clinical trials with very large number of recruitment, it is not a useful medication or effective. Uh, Lupinavir, Tenavir, Dr. Yassin has mentioned. I'll, I'll just move, but you can see that in your right, there's a lot of clinical trials. Uh, so Fevivirvir is an uh, antiviral that is already in use in Japan for uh, flu. It's uh, effective and there's multiple clinical trials on flu. But they are repurposing this medication for COVID-19. Uh, uh, it's now approved in China and Japan, but it's not in, in the Western countries. Currently, we have actually locally two studies uh, sponsored by Kimark for I'll talk about them in a minute. So dexamethasone actually is the opposite story. So early in, in, in the disease from China, from China, we have a couple of uh, studies showing that maybe steroid is harmful. And we actually uh, waited for these clinical trials to show if this medication uh, might be useful. And actually, in specific population, people on, on mechanical ventilation and people hospitalized on oxygen, this uh, medication, which is cheap and useful and uh, available in most of the countries, uh, uh, is effective and would reduce the mortality. So here where the clinical trial would have had its uh, uh, ad. Now, convalescent plasma, there is a lot of controversy about convalescent plasma. I know that there is a couple of trials showed uh, it might be effective, then followed by larger trial, but I think we can uh, still wait for uh, other ongoing trials to show uh, uh, the real effect of convalescent plasma and if it is having its uh, specific population. As you know, convalescent plasma is something that we take from the recovered patient and we use it for patients who is, uh, in, uh, who is critically ill uh, with COVID-19. I'll just skip the other examples, but azithromycin uh, currently is on uh, going uh, clinical trial among recovery, remote and others. Also, interferon, some uh, result is out, as, uh, as Dr. Yassin mentioned, but uh, still we are waiting for other results. Tocilizumab is a medication that we used over the last few months, off-label. Now we started seeing uh, results from uh, clinical trials showing that it's actually not as effective as we thought of, but still uh, there is a couple of clinical trials that might release the results very soon. 
So these are also other examples of indication that currently uh, uh, on uh, uh, clinical trials. It's very interesting to see how uh, recovery uh, clinical trial uh, doing their uh, implementation of new medications. So just recently they added aspirin as one of the arms for possible treatment for COVID-19. And they have their scientific committee who are evaluating every single medication that's introduced as a possible treatment for uh, COVID-19. I just wanted to do a very quick exercise to see in, in this uh, uh, very large registry, the clinicaltrial.gov, uh, how much clinical trial do you have. So this is not the only one, you have Chinese and you have European uh, registries, but this is the most famous one. So worldwide more than 3,000, mainly in uh, the States and, and Europe. But let's see where, where we are. So here is Saudi Arabia, we have around 49 centers participating in clinical trials and we have around 24, 24 uh, studies. But if we take this down to the level of interventional uh, uh, clinical uh, trials, uh, it will uh, actually be cut by half. I think it's like 13 uh, interventional clinical trials. So these are some of the clinical trials ongoing in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, these three is about using some of the supplements uh, to treat uh, patients with COVID-19 among different uh, type of, of patients, and they are targeting the outcome of the disease. Now, also, we have some inhalers that are uh, introduced, as Victoria has seen, some inhalers, I mentioned some inhalers might be useful. So, we are having hypertonic saline and alpha and antitrypsin as an inhalation, and this study also in two centers in Saudi Arabia. Uh, also, we have the awake. On, I can show it here. So we have two studies, which is part of international uh, studies, uh, uh, KMARC and uh, uh, our ICU in King Abdul's Medical City is part of that, among other centers in Saudi Arabia and outside, uh, uh, looking after the uh, oxygenation of uh, the patient and uh, the way to improve uh, the, the hypoxia. Uh, also, another very interesting study that was run among, uh, among a lot of centers in Saudi Arabia. It was initially planned as phase two with 40 patients, and then it was extended further with a larger number of patients. This study is concluded, and hopefully we can see uh, a positive result with convalescent plasma. And this is an, a national uh, example of, of the good uh, uh, collaboration. So a clinical trial among uh, probably I mentioned earlier. So this is a fact trial, which is using a combination of antivirals. It's a multi-center, around nine to 10 centers, and it's a randomized open label clinical trials that's currently ongoing, and hopefully we can see a result uh, in the next two months. Also, another one uh, treating the mild uh, COVID-19 patients, uh, and it is actually blinded uh, and placebo-controlled trial, and also it's multi-center uh, around the kingdom. We have currently seven active sites. So basically we want to, uh, to, to do a clinical trial. We require a lot of resources in, in terms of funding, in terms of uh, experience, in terms of having uh, manpower and, and teams who can be able to, to do the clinical trials. And also I caught this uh, from the New England Journal of Medicine when they were talking about improving clinical trials in uh, uh, during the COVID-19. And they mentioned three points. First, maximizing the trial access and enrolling more patients and reaching out to the population where we can uh, get more uh, and more patients. Also, uh, the, uh, to improve the national platform and uh, promote uh, the collaboration in clinical trials uh, in terms of getting more sites and doing good multi-center clinical trials. And third thing is uh, the infrastructure. We have a very good, a very good clinical practice and, and, and tertiary care centers uh, and, and hospitals who can do clinical trials, but they need the support in doing that. So these are the, uh, the things that I think we need, to, we need to, to tackle and we need to work on. And then I, I just want to mention these two examples that I was referring to. So these are the two trials that actually showed uh, uh, an earlier and uh, uh, good evidence about some indication, which is solidarity when you have a core protocol, when you have more than 30 countries participating in one clinical trial, uh, and also uh, a recovery trial in UK, they have more than 170 sites participating, 
and actually they uh, have a pragmatic uh, randomized clinical trial they are promoting not to use any uh, off-label medication unless it is with within a clinical trial and they managed to um, how you have one minute one minute so i'm actually uh, done Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed, uh, for such a good uh, um, talk. So now moving to our fourth uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Walid Zahir. Um, title of his talk would be COVID vaccination trial in the regions. So please uh, go ahead, Dr. Walid. Thank you. So, uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Saeed wa Charaf wujud fi fi laqa. The hadith, tabaan, saikoon. Baad ma tafadl zumala al karam wa sattatna al fadl. عن الحديث عن التجارب السريرية في المنطقة. فأنا أحب أركز أيكون. توك على التجارب السريرية فيما يخص اللقاح أو الأمصال حقة الكوفيد-19 قبل ما نتكلم على التجارب السريرية كما تفضل الزملاء الأعزاء وسددنا التجارب السريرية I'll shift in English uh, it, It's the bread and butter of research الـ الـ التجارب السريرية هي نتاج التجارب قبل السريرية اللي تكون موجودة زي ما تفضل الدكتور أحمد في حديثه اللي نسميها ترانزليشنال ميديسن أو أخذ التجارب ما قبل السريرية وتحويلها إلى منتج أو علاج وهذا هو الأساس في أي بحث طبي التجارب السريرية Dr. Mudid, sorry for interrupting. It's uh, it's a kind of it's a bit too noisy from your side. Can you set up the mic? Uh, okay. زي ما تفضلنا التجارب السريرية في العالم تكون تكون أغلبتها مركز في الدول أمريكا الشمالية في أوروبا هي تأخذ نصيب الأسد في عندنا التجارب السريرية في آسيا منطقة الشرق الأوسط تتصدر السعودية وجمهورية مصر العربية تتصدر القائمة بأكثر الدول اللي يكون توجد فيها الأبحاث السريرية في المنطقة طبعا للأسف ما زلنا في الشرق الأوسط خلف العالم كله when it comes to clinical trials حسب البلمونت اندكس ولو أنه السعودية عندها رقم كبير في clinical trials ولكننا ما زلنا نستهلك أكثر مما ننتج من data when it comes to clinical trial طبعا ما تزال السعودية is the leading country among the GCC countries and in the Middle East one of the leading طبعا السعودية تتميز بأنه فيها الانفراستركشر حق الكلينيكال ريسيرش من أكثر الدول في منطقة الشرق الأوسط استيعابا للكلينيكال ترايلز بوجود المستشفيات ووجود الخبرات الطبية والقامات اللي موجودة في المملكة وهذا اللي يؤدي إلى وجود عدد كبير من الشركات الأدوية تذهب إلى المملكة لعمل الكلينيكال ترايلز في سنتر زي ما تفضل الدكتور أحمد والأساتذة الأفاضل طبعا ما زلنا نفتقد إلى مراكز الكلينيكال ترايلز ديديكيتد يعني مخصوصة للكلينيكال ترايلز موجود جزء منها قلة في المملكة على مستوى المنطقة تفتقد المنطقة تقريبا السعودية هي أكثر دولة في منطقة الشرق الأوسط فيها ديديكيتد وخصص الكلينيكال ترايل طبعا ليش why do we say clinical trials are important because أول شيء الكوفيد have showed us أنه we need clinical trials العالم كله الحين قائم العلاج على الكوفيد موجود بسبب وجود الكلينيكال ترايلز غير كذا يعني في دراسه قامت فيها ليمان براذرز 
لو ناخذ اخذت الدوله 1% فقط من قطاع الكلينيكال ترايز على مستوى العالم احنا نتكلم على 10000 او اكثر مريض ممكن يستفيدوا من علاجات متطوره اكثر من 15000 وظيفه اكثر من 300 مليون دولار او 500 مليون دولار استثمار في المملكه وطبعا اللي اهم من هذا كله الجنريشن اوف داتا اللي هو اللي اللي يتمحور حواليه الملتقى كله وهاو دو يو جنريت ان هاوس داتا بدل ما يكون اعتمادا على داتا جنريتد فروم اوتسايد زي ما ذا نيو كوتيشن في العالم الحين داتا از ذا نيو اول within 5 or 10 years uh, data will be the most lucrative uh, currency for all the countries not oil not uh, it, it's data uh, طبعا هذا لما ناخذ المحور هذا ونطبقه على الفاكسينز طبعا الفاكسين صناعه الفاكسين في العالم واللي يترتب عليها الكلينيكال ترايلز uh, تنحصر برضه في uh, دول امريكا الشماليه دول اوروبا طبعا تتصدر الولايات المتحده ودول في اوروبا القائمه وطبعا اكبر مصنع للعالم موجود في الهند هو اللي يصنع وهذه كلها تعتمد على اللقاحات التقليديه اذا راينا اللي موجود الحين اللقاحات اللقاحات تعتمد على ايذر لايف اتنويتد يعني نوع حي من الفيروس شبه حي او انه يكون مقتول او انكتيفيتد أو يكون جزء من الفيروس موجود اللي هو بروتين سب يونت وهذه نسميها اللقاحات التقليدية. بعدين في نيو تكنولوجي اللي طلعت في السنوات الأخيرة اللي هي الفيرال فيكتورز الدي إن إي والماسنجر أر إن إي. إذا رأينا اللي موجود الآن في الكلينيكال ترايلز موست أوف ذا كلينيكال ترايلز أر موجودة في نيو تكنولوجيز. موديرنا فايزر ذا روشن فاكسين سينوفاك ذي ار بيزد اون ذا نيو تكنولوجيز ايذر ماسنجر ار ان اي او ادينو فايروس ذير ار ون اون جوينج فيس 3 اور 2 ون اوف ذيم از ذا سينوفار فيس 3 كلينيكال ترايل ويتش از ان ان اكتيفيتد طبعا الان اكتيفيتد سيف اند اتس هاف بين بروفن تو بي سيف سينس 50 اور 60 اور فيرز موست of the vaccines اللي نستخدمها تكون inactivated طبعا في قائمات يعني طويله من الاكزامبلز على each of them اذا راينا على التصنيع التصنيع طبعا دول مثل الصين والهند عندها القابليه طبعا امريكا الشماليه اوروبا تقريبا الطاقه الاستيعابيه للعالم قبل الكوفيد كان حوالي من 1.3 من الى 2 مليار فاكسين في السنه طبعا يحاول العالم الان رفع الطاقه الاستيعابيه الى حوالي 3 الى 5 مليار فاكسين في السنه من الفاكسينز اللي موجوده في العالم ان فيس 3 كلينيكال ترايل اللي موجوده الحين في الشرق الاوسط هي السينوفارم فيس 3 كلينيكال ترايل اللي اتشرف بقياده الكلينيكال ترايل WHO ذا ترايل واز ا سكسسفول كولابوريشن بين جروب 42 ويتش اي ام ذا تشيف ريسيرش اوفيسر اوف Uh, Sinopharm, which is the biggest uh, vaccine manufacturer uh, in China, and uh, a PDC, which is the CRO, it's a Saudi-based company. التحالف من الثلاثة أدى إلى وجود the biggest uh, phase three clinical trial uh, في تاريخ الشرق الأوسط وهي الأكبر في على مستوى العالم الآن when it comes to uh, COVID vaccine uh, clinical phase three clinical trials. Uh, The primary objective was to evaluate the protective efficacy of COVID-19 inactivated vaccine after two doses of immunization. The target population was 18 years and old and above. It's a randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled clinical trial. The sample size is 45,000, which, as I said, it's the biggest in the world so far. The immunization schedule it consists of two doses, one at day zero and one on day 21. Uh, um, the pre-requisite tests is a PCR uh, before the enrollment and blood samples for baseline antibodies uh, at different time intervals. 
uh, end points, the trial end points is to observe the incidence of adverse effects uh, within 30 minutes of each dose. So, I had an observation period muscle or after giving the vaccine. Observe the incidence of adverse effects uh, in, uh, for the short period, day 21, 28, 7 days, and for the long period, around 12 months, and to observe, of course, the efficacy. Uh, to evaluate if there is an increase in the baseline of antibody generation in people who receive the vaccine. Uh, there are other endpoints, I'm not going to go through all of them, uh, but they resemble all the ongoing vaccine uh, clinical trials in the world. Uh, they almost have the same uh, efficacy endpoint. Uh, the trial was started on the 16th of July. Uh, it started in, in ADNIC, which we transferred into the biggest largest vaccination site in the world, capable of uh, seeing more than 3,000 people a day. Uh, the, uh, the clinical trial have led to many other uh, added value with the clinical trial, new corporations, manpower, IT alignment, data integration, dashboards, communication, a lot of added value which added to the, uh, the phase three clinical trial implementation. Uh, we opened it in uh, in many countries, so we opened it at the 16th of July, another site in Emirates uh, in Sharjah on the 5th of August, in Kingdom of Bahrain 19th of August, in Jordan 27th of August, and in Egypt lastly. Uh, how close are we to the, uh, to the first inactivated vaccine? Uh, the 45,000 volunteers recruited were in the Middle East who had a COVID trial. This is not a vaccine that was tried on other people. This is a vaccine that was tried on other uh, on Arab people and others. Uh, there are more than 125 nationalities. So this clinical trial did not suffer from any ethnicity problems. Uh, we managed to recruit people from all over the world. Uh, our results are very encouraging. Uh, the interim analysis have started. This is the first time we announced this. And very, very, very soon, I think within the next, I'm not going to say even weeks, and no major side effects were observed. All the side effects observed in the study is uh, level one and two. Uh, severe side effects were moderately a level three and four were not observed. Because the vaccine is based on a traditional safe vaccine, inactivated vaccines. Uh, we already have emergency authorization in three countries. Uh, there are three more countries that have applied with uh, to have the emergency authorization. Yesterday, we had a very encour encouraging call with Saudi FDA. Uh, we are on, on the process of actually also uh, uh, bringing the vaccine uh, here. Uh, the interim analysis, as I said, are due very soon. Uh, this is one of the success stories of how the pandemic and the pandemic has a lot of uh, negative effects, but one of the positive effects, like Zumala and uh, Al Aiza have uh, mentioned, that uh, it brought a lot of clinical trials and a lot of data and a lot of collaboration and a lot of cooperation all over the world. It brought the world in, in in unity when it comes to science, scientists from all over the world are correlating with each other to find uh, drugs and vaccines. Uh, this is maybe one good aspect of uh, the uh, COVID uh, added uh, to the fact that we also uh, soon are we going to see with the announcement from other companies, Pfizer, Moderna, I think soon uh, this collaboration have resulted in finding a what we hopefully think is going to be an end to COVID, which is finding a vaccine. Uh, by this, I end my talk and thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Um, uh, Walid. just on time. Um, uh, we'll now move to Professor uh, Fahad Zamil uh, and his uh, the title of his talk is The Effect of COVID Pandemic on Routine Pediatric Immunizations coverage rate, experience of main university hospitals in Saudi Arabia. And we'll, after that, we'll uh, summarize the talks of the session and we'll start taking questions. Okay, so go ahead, please, Dr. Fah. Thank you.
Dr. Fahad, just make it in the slideshow. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina wa Rabbina Muhammad wa ala ahli wa sahbihi ajma'in. Dr. Maha, chairman of, of the meeting, uh, dear colleagues and uh, uh, audience and attendants, uh, it's given me a great pleasure and honor uh, to be uh, with you and we talk about, uh, you know, a, a topic uh, which I feel, you know, I am a pediatrician, okay, and uh, I promise you that my presentation will be easily digested um, as, 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 as Pete's. Uh, actually, I thought probably is uh, discussing uh, this article which is just published uh, from our department at College of Medicine uh, last month, uh, and actually it is uh, probably about the effects of the coronavirus disease uh, uh, or a pandemic uh, on, on the routine immunization and, and children. Actually, what you know, uh, I'm sure nobody will forget this date, which is March 11, when WHO announced the emergency uh, issue about uh, COVID-19. And also nobody will forget uh, 2nd of March, where the, the first uh, COVID-19 case was reported in Saudi Arabia. So what happens is that uh, after that announcement, uh, of course, the government uh, and, and Minister of Health uh, has announced that the lockdown. And the lockdown, of course, uh, you know, has affected, uh, you know, a, a lot of things, has affected, uh, you know, politics, uh, business, uh, health, and actually, uh, this is why there are some health issues which has been affected uh, by this lockdown. Why? Because, you know, hospitals are really making themselves to be ready uh, for emergencies, okay? And they cancel most of the elective things. And uh, we thought at that time to see, has this really affected also, uh, you know, our, uh, uh, our immunization? Okay, uh, we know that uh, probably, you know, COVID-19 is, is not a disease of uh, pediatrics. Uh, I mean, it, it is probably uh, not as bad as an adult. It, it affects everybody, even pediatrics, even in unit, even in newborn babies. But yet, uh, actually, this disease is uh, quite really, uh, you know, uh, easy and simple in, in, in pediatrics. But what actually, what the crisis this, you know, this disease has made is in, in, the, in the other issue, which is actually the routine vaccine. And, you know, I mean, you know, the routine vaccine is, is very important. And as you know, that nowadays we are uh, very proud that we are actually, uh, we can prevent, okay, almost 20 infectious diseases. Okay, with, with the vaccines. I mean, you know, small boxes is out, measles is out. Now we are happy that two of the, you know, uh, uh, the polio vaccine is, is out of the globe. Now we have only one. So honestly, uh, this is actually uh, make us to think, what can we do? Can we, uh, can we do something? Can we, uh, you know, study this issue uh, in parallel? and see what can we uh, what what will be our finding uh, is it something really need to worry about or it is something uh, you know uh, we have to do something about it so uh, this the study uh, actually uh, happened to be done uh, in uh, king saud university medical city uh, this uh, you know medical city is almost uh, 1800 beds uh, we have like 3,500, uh, you, you know, delivery. Uh, so we thought of probably doing a retrospective study and to look to our figures. And uh, the, we, we could go to the electronic files of probably 15,000 uh, of our children and to look exactly uh, how does uh, their vaccine, uh, you know, schedule looks like. And like what you see now in front of you, this is actually the results, okay? And, uh, you know, just concentrate on the black, uh, you know, column, uh, because the black column is actually, this is March, uh, 
2019, okay, where, uh, you know, uh, uh, the COVID-19 is, is around, okay? Uh, now, when you see the other colors, they represent, uh, you know, uh, other, uh, you know, year like uh, 2017, 2018, and 2019, and March 2020, okay? This is the black column. So it is very clear to you that there is actually uh, really, uh, you know, uh, the, the immunization rate is, is unfortunately is not as what it should or at what as we, we want. Maybe one might ask why the column, uh, it is, this is 2020 March and yet it is, it, is, uh, it is high or it is normal. It is normal because this is what we call birth vaccine and usually birth vaccine are done deliberately in the hospital. So the mother uh, does not go, uh, you know, and, and need to come back, all right? And this is actually what we have in March and this is what we have in April. So if you if you concentrate also, you see what how's the effect because maybe the lockdown is more severe. People are uh, you know are very much worried and terrified. I I cannot describe you know mothers when they come to the clinic they are really terrified uh, about you know their children uh, getting uh, um, uh, COVID nineteen and the same thing also in. Uh, uh, month of may which is the same thing you know uh, unfortunately we are not doing good in in, in 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 the vaccine and this is really this is really terrifying uh because uh you know imagine imagine that we could not uh, let's say uh you know vaccinate our children because of let's say measles to start with what will happen what will happen is that unfortunately we will have an outbreak of measles measles virus the ability for one uh, you know infected patient he can infect more than 18 so it is really is gonna be a disaster and then unfortunately uh, in top of covid 19 we will have also measles an outbreak then unfortunately uh, you know our uh, health system will be counteracting uh, you know an another another problem and unfortunately we're worried about our health system will be will be failed. Uh, then, actually, uh, you see, if you see the this uh, table, which is which is very you know uh, clear, just telling you this in figures. So, if you see uh, you know the, the the figures of 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 the vaccines, look at this uh, to two hundred eighty one uh, drop down to fifty four. This is a very significant drop almost almost 80 percent okay uh, while the perth as we said so no it is a little bit and and name it 62 percent uh 70 percent and and so on and so forth okay so this is beyond doubt that unfortunately uh, covid 19 is is, uh, is has affected our routine vaccine and actually we are not only the only the only society which has been affected that there is a lot of probably you know uh published published article about the you know this issue in michigan in new york city and all, all and, and and also other other countries so the conclusion of of uh, probably the the study is is that the huge impact of coronavirus disease uh, uh, pandemic and child vaccination will require an urgent vaccination recovery plans with innovative approach and the future action plans to maintain vaccination coverage during any subsequent pandemic. And this really, this really is very important that we have to sit down and think what are probably, you know, you know there, there are a lot of ways we can do it uh, maybe we leave it for the discussion if anybody raises the questions or actually, uh, you know, I can comment on, on, on what are the, the you know, what are the plan. We can do a lot. We can do a lot to, to probably safely deliver the, 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 the vaccine of, uh, to our children. Especially my main interest is actually is the, the you know, the vaccination 
in, in the first year, which is for me is a very important. Uh, okay, I think that is my slide, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Fahad, um, for uh, excellent talk. Um, so uh, by this, we finish our uh, session. However, um, we still have uh, time for uh, questions from audience. Before that, I would like to summarize what our outstanding speakers highlighted. Started by Prof. Asker, who stated that medicine are evolving and the science are evolving all the time especially in the era of uh, having emerging viruses uh, like the one we're having now with the COVID, it, that require more knowledge and basic science to be covered and tools that require us to have more information on the, how the virus is transmission. And from there we can adopt or we can have a, a strategy to minimize the risk and mitigate. And then we have Professor uh, Arabi who highlighted the issue with the uh, MERS and how the lesson we learned from MERS helped us uh, through COVID. So he highlighted that still uh, MERS has highest mortality rate that can reach to 67%. And although the miracle trial had highlighted um, showed benefit from interferon beta and uh, lumnavir and ritronavir, that wasn't the case with the, with the COVID as seen by the solidity trial. And although new studies showed some interferon benefits uh, in, as inhalation, but still more studies are required. Then moving to Dr. Muhammad, who's nicely described all the medication that were described to uh, treat uh, COVID. And um, as we all know, that still, all, um, not significantly in all studies showed that would help in all stages of the disease uh, by co uh, caused by SARS-CoV-2. And although steroids still is number one now that proven to decrease mortality less uh, to 35%, especially in those who required oxygens, and followed by convalescent plasma and tocilizumab, but still studies showed some no significant uh, um, difference in mortality. Um, although still, um, this is just the beginning and require more info in, the, in that regard. Um, also, he highlighted the, uh, the list of ongoing trials in the kingdom nicely. We're very happy and excited to know the outcome of these clinical ongoing trials in the kingdom. Um, uh, moving to Dr. Walid, who's described again the, uh, uh, nicely the role that the kingdom um, and uh, doing in the region to lead the clinical trials and all the resources resources and knowledge and the expertise that we have and we're very proud and waiting for the result of that trials and also waiting for the trial of Sinopharma trial that is uh, one of the biggest trials that have more than uh, 45,000 patients enrolled um, um, ending by Dr. Fahad very nicely describe how um, childhood uh, vaccinations been affected by COVID and by um, by this is it, it's put us at risk of having another emerging and another outbreak that we uh, we don't have the time uh, and maybe we avoidable it's very avoidable um, uh, to prevent such a things and he described the recovery plan for that so by this um, um, we can now start by our uh, questions and answer uh, for um, um, from our audience so we'll see the questions. Okay, so uh, first questions we'll have for Prof. Al Asker. Um, they said, uh, um, if I can have all of our uh, respected uh, speakers camera on and all the panelists uh, on board, please. So Prof. Al Asker, you have the first question is how important clinical trial to medicine and what's the status of our region in overall contribution worldwide? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, very, uh, very good question uh, indeed. Uh, uh, the, um, as I highlighted in my talk, um, the clinical trials are the one which uh, shape up the medicine basically. It's very important, very essential uh, to any uh, community um, at the level of decision makers, uh, scientists, physicians, as well as the community, the public itself to understand the importance of clinical trials because without these clinical trials, we will not be able to know which intervention is better than the other. Um, waiting for clinical trials to be done by somebody else 
um, is is like going backwards. It's, it's, you will become a follower. So in order to be innovative and lead, you would have to create your own clinical trials, test your intervention, uh, test your medical practice, and let the um, and and then publish it. So you get others to follow you, and you become a leader in medicine. So it's basically um, a, a, a component of leadership as well. Um, now, what's our situation, unfortunately, in the region um, is um, we're moving forward. However, it's not that great yet, and we have a big gap to catch up with uh, compared to other countries. So if you look at, uh, for example, um, the figures on um, um, uh, it's already been uh, uh, shown uh, in one of the presentations. Um, if we part uh, currently, we don't participate. We don't reach one percent of the share of the international clinical trials, and hopefully, uh, we would reach that level. Especially now at the Kingdom, um, KMark, with the help of Nidlib, the um, um, uh, the program for the uh, development of industry and uh, logistic services, which is one of the uh, Vision 2030 uh, uh, programs, supporting uh, a, an initiative uh, uh, by KMARC and a, a national initiative to lead uh, the clinical trials and to enhance clinical trials in Saudi Arabia to reach that level of 1% or even 0.5% of the share of the market in the, uh, um, in the international. With that, there will be impact not only on health of the community, but also on the economy of the country. Okay, nice. Um, um, so now um, we have another question for Dr. Uh, Yassin, uh, Prof. Yassin. Uh, what are the lessons learned from MERS therapeutic research that have an impact on COVID research therapeutics? Thank you, very important question. So I think... Uh, uh, the experience with MERS, which uh, in Saudi Arabia started in 2012 for several years, has enabled us actually to respond uh, effectively and efficiently for COVID um, in several aspects. Even in the clinical and hospital response was really, we were preempted by the experience from COVID. At research level, I think the network that was established with MERS COVID, and I, for example, I'll talk about critical care, um, has been uh, built for uh, several years. So with COVID-19, it now start to move much faster than what when we started. I think building the infrastructure, building the networking is very helpful. In addition, of course, what uh, was mentioned by uh, my colleagues is that these are uh, somewhat related viruses. Not, they are not exactly the same, but they are somewhat related. They are from the same family. So you could see many of the therapeutics that were tested for uh, MERS-CoV uh, were also tested in, in COVID-19. Many of the concepts uh, that were tested in MERS-CoV were used as a, a starting point, at least, for COVID-19. And so it, it really helped moving things forward. I think uh, uh, the experience built from now COVID-19 and and, um, uh, and MERS-CoV has been great, and I think it established a great uh, platform for conducting research in other aspects as well. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, Yassin. I think this answered the question very well. Um, I have a question for Dr. Mohammed Boussaid. Um, is it's again talking about the role of clinical trial in the kingdom, which I believe that was answered by uh, Prof. Alaska. But uh, um, I, I'd like the, I'd like to take this question. So, is there any national initiative to improve the clinical trial work and collaboration within the kingdom? This question to Dr. Mohammed Said. <laughs> I think, yes, so Dr. Asher just uh, highlighted the uh, new initiative with the program of the Logistics and NIDLIB. It is uh, already uh, a part of our Vision 2030. Uh, so KMARC is taking the lead. It should be a national uh, network there where they can uh, enhance the clinical trials. Uh, what we did before, both Yassin and KMARC through FACT trial and EBIMALD now, 
and other trials, it's most likely uh, just a personal and, and uh, efforts and with help with KMARC and other research centers. But this national uh, project and initiative, I think, will take us to another level where we will get more uh, uh, sites, more centers who can be part of clinical trials, inshallah. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Busaid. Um, and for Dr. Walid, um, what is uh, the progress of MENA trial, Dr. Walid? Someone want to know about MENA trial? So, uh, as, I, as I said, uh, the results of the ongoing uh, clinical trial in the, in the Middle East, the Sinopharm 1, uh, will be announced very soon, uh, within the next few days, inshallah. And uh, it was announced a few days back that the results are really positive. We are really proud of the work that was done here, uh, having the biggest, largest clinical uh, trial on a COVID vaccine in the Middle East is, is should be something that uh, Will, will will be for us as a role model of how can we uh, recruit more clinical trials to the Middle East. Very nice. So, Dr. Fahad, how do, um, someone is asking, how do I resume my child vaccines after pandemics? Uh, this, is a, this is a big question, honestly. Uh, and uh, as I said, uh, and uh, probably if you align me, um, uh, alternative in such, uh, you know, a pandemic. All right. and I think uh, we we got a lot of solutions. Honestly, you know, number one is uh, healthcare centers. We can we can ask only the healthcare centers, you know, in the cities to be only for vaccine and. Uh, based on appointments and we close waiting area. We can do it also, we can do the vaccination in the park, as long as there is no gathering, home vaccination. Um, we, we, we can do it what, like what uh, the successful uh, COVID swab by the car. We can do also uh, what we call it car, car vaccination. But to answer back the questions, and I, I think, uh, you know, our is probably the first, the first year vaccine, which is very important. For the following, okay, we, we can do it, uh, especially uh, that we have to make at least minimum, minimum of two to three months between a vaccine and another, all right? Uh, and this can be done easily uh, uh, with the help of... Uh, سمعتيني يا دكتورة ولا؟ لا راح صوت حضرتك راح صوت دكتورة أيوه الحين يعني نعم إيه لكن يعني الجواب ما سمعتي آخر آخر يمكن ثانية مرة أيوه أنا آخر كلمة أقول إنه يعني علشان يعني نعيد جدولة التطعيمات الأساسية للأطفال بين التطعيم والتطعيم تمام يكون على الأقل 2 to 3 months uh, duration. Well, this is can be done, uh, Dr. Maha, by any pediatrician around. He can fix, uh, you know, the table again. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm sure and, uh, this is this is the beauty of uh, of what we call, you know, vaccines. Vaccines are, uh, you know, dealing with a an, an, an very smart immune system, which can recall uh, the immunity at any time. Okay, I agree with Hadatak Rufahad, and especially in the kingdom, we have the 937. So, if the family have a concern where to go to get the vaccine, they can call 937 and get it uh, settled. Uh, exactly. Um, exactly. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fahad. We're still going to go back to you uh, for more questions, but now I believe we have a question for Prof. Al Asker on how we should enhance our research and development production. Dr. Alaska? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, very important question. And, and that um, requires a um, number of stakeholders, actually. I mean, we're talking here research and development, um, which means that not only 
universities, research centers, uh, but also um, industry uh, collaboration. Um, so I think um, if, if I wanted to focus on probably the most uh, important elements, uh, it would be that such research and development should be one of the you know, strategic component uh, of the country. So, so it has to be uh, an essential component of the strategy that at, you know, and it's already probably part of, it's already part of the 20, uh, vision 2030 and we see things moving now towards enhancing this. So uh, we're hoping to see, um, you know, um, a, a body that's in charge of the R&D, uh, focusing on the R&D obstacles, um, uh, you know, supporting not only financial support, but logistics support logistic and, and, and manpower and um, uh, plans. Um, so that's important. Yeah, I agree. So uh, now, Prof. Yassin, what are the prospects for collaborative research and cl uh, critical care in Saudi Arabia? The prospect. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, great question. I'm very optimistic about uh, the future for research uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia in critical care and in other uh, fields as well. I think the uh, experience that we had with the miracle trial illustrated that we, we can do it. Uh, miracle trial that I presented was not an easy study. It's, uh, yes, the number of patients is not high, but I think that's one of the challenges. It's, it's, not, it's easy to do a study when you have a lot of patients. But when you don't have a lot of patients, it's a challenge. And exactly. it's collaboration between teams, collaboration between the clinicians, collaboration with the research center, with KMARC, with the different department, was well, just simply amazing. Uh, and uh, big, so big credit to everyone who has helped in this. And I think the future is bright as we have to um, collaborate. And this is what you could see what's making impact on the big picture is the collaborative work. You see studies, uh, including many, 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 many sites. Uh, Very nice. I think also we need to have a critical mass of researchers on the same field. So we, we can have, uh, we can debate things, discuss things scientifically and make it uh, fine tune them to, to be at, at the highest level. So I think uh, very uh, bright future. Um, uh, there are a few things need to be improved, but uh, um, but I, I'm, I'm very optimistic about this. Yeah, me too. Thank you very much, um, uh, Prof. Arabi. Now, um, Dr. Mohammed, um, what are the update on MERS-CoV vaccine trials started at KMARC in collaboration with Oxford University? Dr. Mohammed, Said. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. So, uh, we have the Chadox vaccine, uh, uh, phase 1B, uh, ongoing in, in KMARC and King Abdiz Medical City here in Riyadh. Uh, it is uh, with uh, collaboration with uh, Oxford University. It's the same vector that they are using now for COVID-19. So it's somewhat uh, uh, related, but it's targeting MERS uh, uh, core. So uh, uh, currently, actually this month, we are going inshallah to conclude the study. So the study was started around 11 months ago. Uh, we recruited 24 uh, participants. It is the first phase one a clinical trial in the kingdom and i hope inshallah for more phase one because as dr Asker mentioned it's one of the gaps that we need to fill to reach uh, the the r d and uh, to reach uh, a productive uh, researches inshallah nice so do we have any preliminary results uh, we can know about this mers uh, vaccine trial like we, did we manage to post any immunity well I, I can't say that it is safe at least so okay. we know that for sure uh the immuno immunology uh, result we are doing it in like three levels we are doing t cells and antibodies and pseudo antibodies so i think we are still uh, uh working on the data but we will try our best to publish it as soon as possible okay nice nice news okay. uh okay so dr Walid, um do you uh, do you want to share with audience other ongoing trial other than MENA trials? Um, uh, we can share also that uh, the uh, other COVID uh, vaccine trial, the, uh, the Gamalaya or the Russian vaccine, is also ongoing. Uh, I think it's ongoing in uh, Egypt, 
Emirates, I think maybe in Saudi as well. Uh, this is another study that is going for a phase three clinical trial uh, vaccine. Uh, I think they just started a few weeks ago. Uh, there are other uh, phase three uh, uh, and actually phase two that have been approaching so far. So the the scientific uh, world is now more more mature. So the big companies have pushed their vaccine first. So that's why we ended up with the ongoing uh, four or five clinical trials, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Oxford, uh, BioNTech, uh, the uh, Gamalaya, which is just entered phase three, the Sinopharm, Sinovac, and CanSino. These are the advanced uh, clinical trials that are already ongoing. I think two or three of them are already ongoing in the Middle East. Sinopharm is the biggest. Uh, Sinovac and the uh, Gamalaya vaccine are uh, they have they are still ongoing as well. Uh, other than that, there are other new players that are going to be so we are not expecting that this is the the end this is the start actually a lot of clinical trials will be started at 2021 uh, by other uh, vaccine manufacturers and a lot of clinical trials on not only vaccine vaccines but treatments uh, on new therapies so whatever we are trying to do now when it comes to the therapies which is not really my area but the uh, the other uh, speakers have have highlighted that that this we have, we have used more more of that traditional we're using for something else and we applied it to uh, to uh, SARS two or or COVID nineteen, but a lot of companies now are developing new and uh, specifically made for COVID nineteen uh, therapies that are going to enter clinical trials in the next year, and again this is will this is. Uh, in uh, capitalizes on whatever questions were addressed to the other speakers how important are clinical trials 2020 is will be uh smaller in, in impact than 2021 we are expecting that 2021 will see uh, a rise in the number of clinical trials and a rise of number of publications and research targeted towards uh, covid 19. Thank you very much, uh, um, Dr. Wali. It's very promising, inshallah, but I'm glad 2021 will be a better year for all of us. Um, so um, going back to Prof. Al Asker, um, um, how do you uh, um, assess our regional attempt in case of developing vaccine? So this question was for Dr. Prof. Al Asker. Um, well, um yeah, this is again an um, excellent question. Uh, definitely, um, we had uh, recently um, the annual forum for medical research, um, where we um, uh, had you know local participation from various um, research institutions and universities who are participating or contributing in the development of vaccine at the local level. Um, there are challenges still. Um, uh, I would say uh, there are early stages and there are advanced stages. And when we say advanced, I mean just before the development. Now, beyond the development, you need you need facilities like GMP facility, which is a facility that's specific to make a, a you know a, a production of the vaccine, and then. You need um, pharma industry involved to develop large scale and clinical trials. You need phase one clinical trials, etc. So there are components that are missing still uh, in the um, sequence of the development of the vaccine. Um, this is being currently um, uh, improved and made, made available. However, it will take a while. Um, but there are initial attempts which are very promising. In general. Allah. Thank you, Dr. Uh, so, um, uh, Prof. So, uh, Arabi, again, you have another question about what are the lessons learned from COVID so far in terms of therapeutic to improve the efficacy for further uh, therapy or medication? Prof. Arabi? Prof. Thank Yassin? You. Uh, yeah. yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I, yes, I can hear. So, uh, yeah, if I understood the question uh, correctly, it's about how to make uh, research more efficient 
uh, in terms of uh, therapeutics? And I, I think uh, this very important question is probably more general for different type of research. I think uh, we need to have uh, frequent uh, stops and uh, look at how we did things correctly and uh, what things went right, how we did them right. But also we need to look at uh, areas that we can improve. Um, if you look at uh, some of the examples that my colleagues mentioned, for example, recovery was highly recovery trial that was done in the UK was highly efficient trial, highly efficient. Um, uh, and I, I, we need to learn from experiences of how people do these super quick trials, super efficient um, trials. We need to think about our processes and maybe some of uh, areas uh, that sometimes take a little longer than what we expect. We need to look at them and try to make them uh, quicker to be able to respond on a timely fashion to this. This disease is not waiting. I mean, cases happening every day and people are looking for answer. So the short answer to, to this question, I think we need to uh, probably frequently do kind of debriefing on the process of research um, and uh, improve regulatory approval processes, try to make okay. it efficient. Yeah, yeah. I, I think this will be very important. Yeah, I think help, speeding up logistic will help more uh, in that matter. Um, okay, so moving to, uh, I believe this question is for um, uh, Dr. Walid. Um, which vaccine is safer? safer? And which vac vaccine will last longer in terms of COVID? Which vaccine is safe, safer? Like because we hear a lot of uh, vaccine promoting in uh, more than 100 um, vaccine. We know that the approval now for um, the um, Pfizer one. But um, so what do you think, Dr. Walid, is the um, safer vaccine and the one that lasts longer? Uh, the vaccine safety is always a, is a prerequisite to go doing phase three clinical trials. So most of the ongoing phase three clinical trials have proved their safety in a smaller scale in phase one and two. Phase three uh, clinical trials usually are targeted towards proving the efficacy, but also continuing on the safety pathway of any vaccine. Uh, doing a vaccine on 20, 30, 40,000 uh, people and announcing good results usually means that the vaccine is safe. Uh, when it comes to long-term safety for the newer vaccine that are based on new technologies, uh, messenger RNA or adenoviruses, these vaccines have never been used. These technologies have never been used in vaccine manufacturing before. This is the first time an adenovirus or a messenger RNA. I'm not going to give commercial examples, but uh, most of whatever was announced so far uh, are based on new technologies. The long term safety of these new technologies cannot be proven and will not be proven until tens of years at least, some of the medications have proven to have side effects after 10 or 15 or 20 years and they were withdrawn out of market. New technologies comes always with, you know, uh, uncertainty when it comes to long-term uh, safety. But for the short-term safety, most of these studies have already shown a good record of uh, very minimal side effects, which gives uh, um, 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 confidence to the manufacturer and the recipient that at least for for this period during a pandemic these vaccines are safe uh, when it comes to the how long they will last uh, this is a question that only time will tell uh, most of the vaccine manufacturers have started their uh, um, phase one on, and two and three a few months ago we are talking about the earliest maybe six seven months uh, so for any manufacturer to claim that the vaccine will last for a year is 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 not something that can be proven due to the time that COVID has started. We, yesterday was the birthday of COVID, so it was one year for the first case. So, uh, uh, but again, this is something that we will have to follow all these uh, vaccine trials. Uh, and this is 
will come with the conclusion of the clinical trials, which is going to happen mid next year. And by that time, we will have enough data to support how long uh, does a vaccine last. We are expecting that most vaccines will be seasonal, uh, just like the flu vaccine. Uh, so maybe you need more than one shot for, for, the, for the whole year. Uh, some manufacturers claim that the immunity can last up for a year. Only time will tell. Okay, I agree. Thank you very much, Dr. Walid. And another safety question for Dr. Fahad. So, is again, is it safe for uh, our children to get vaccinated during the pandemic? Yeah, I, I, I think it is, it is not only safe, it is very important because as we said, and we don't want to have, you know, uh, two uh, diseases at the same time. I get it is very safe. I, I don't think there is any problem. As, as, as I uh, told before, it is, you know, our immune system is, alhamdulillah, is so smart, okay? So I don't think there is any worry. Uh, I will uh, proceed uh, on my routine uh, immunization, even if there is an outbreak, especially that, as I told you before, that, uh, you know, uh, COVID and PEDS is not as bad as in, in, in adults and those who have comorbidity. Thank you, and I agree with you. It's very important to, uh, and it's so uh, um, safe and important to vaccinate our children um, because risk and benefits, it can be um, um, harming to our uh, little ones. So it's very important to give them the vaccine in time as scheduled. And so another, I believe this is the last question for Prof. Asker, but I have still have uh, other questions for uh, the remaining of the our respected speaker. So, uh, Prof. Asker, how do you link medical research to the biotechnology development and industry? Uh, Prof. Asker, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. Uh, actually, the gate to uh, new biotechnology is, medica is clinical trials and medical research. So the, um, as probably I uh, briefly mentioned in my talk, um, all new products, new vaccines, new um, therapeutics, new devices, medical devices, has to go through uh, robust uh, clinical trials and testing. So there is a quite good link, important link actually, to make a new biotechnology uh, through uh, clinical trials and medical research. In fact, um, now the, uh, um, if we take, for example, um, the current vaccines, how they are developed, most uh, number of them developed in uh, research centers. For example, in Jenner Institute of Oxford, they developed the vaccine, uh, Oxford vaccine, and then it was taken through the startup of the, uh, the small company, biotech company of Oxford, which is uh, Vaxitech, and then taken to AstraZeneca afterwards for larger clinical trials and commercialization. So this sequence is very important actually in the biotechnology um, uh, development uh, in general. So there's quite good link between medical and research centers, startup companies and larger companies. I agree. Uh, so I, I believe last question we have again for Dr. Walid. So how soon are we having the vaccine as available in Saudi Arabia? Like COVID vaccine, when are we going to start uh, open for public? Dr. Walid? I think, uh, yeah, I, I think maybe by early next year, most manufacturers have vouched that they will push for, uh, for their production uh, to be ready by the end of the year, which means that uh, Early next year, I think uh, all the Middle East will have access to most of the announced vaccines uh, in the market. Uh, there is already an ongoing uh, government initiative to secure the vaccine in the kingdom uh, from different manufacturers uh, uh, through uh, the collaboration of so uh, many governmental entities. As soon as it is available on commercial use, I think it is going to be in the, in the Saudi market in no time. Uh, but they have, they, they, we have to differentiate between the companies announcing the results and the company starting production. So a lot of the companies that have announced the results, uh, the production haven't started yet. They have to go through 
application to the for production uh, authorization, which takes time. It's, it's, it's a very thorough process. So we can expect that between the announcement of results and the application uh, finishing, it's a couple of months. So maybe by early next year, I think, in, in, in Saudi and in the Middle East uh, market, the vaccine will be ready. Do you know of any company in particular, it will be sooner than the no another or? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm biased because I'm, <laughs> I'm the study director of the Sinopharm one, but the Sinopharm one is actually ready because uh, of the fact that uh, it's already under emergency authorization in three countries. Uh, and, and this was the, our talks with, with uh, some uh, governmental uh, entities in, in Saudi. So, uh, and, and the, the, already the application for production have, have, uh, have been, uh, it will be filed very soon. So, very soon, but I don't have a time frame, uh, maybe in a few weeks or, or a few months, but it will be ready. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Walid, and to all of our uh, respected uh, speaker. And by this, we reach to the end of our session. I would like to end it by uh, that, as highlighted by all of our distinguished uh, speaker. And although it's almost a year since the start of an announcement, announcement of the clusters of the new virus that caused respiratory tract infection that later was identified as caused by SARS-CoV-2, and then the name of COVID-19 came. It's still a work in progress, although it's been a year now. It's required a lot and still require a lot of collabor collaboration at all sectors, between all sectors and community. And, uh, um, and as the trial is ongoing, uh, we may have new information at any time that either enforce and let us continue to do what we're doing or we push us in another way where we have to change things. So it's a work in progress and every day we learn more information. So we emphasize that we can continue to work. We're just midway. And uh, by this, um, I would like to see if all, any of our uh, respective speaker have anything to add. So um, Dr. Wee, Dr. Fahad, uh, Dr. Ahmad. Um, so, um, Dr. Yassin, Prof. Yassin, if anyone want to uh, add to this? لو سمحتي Chair. أنا أقص إنه يعني يعني رب ضارة نافعة. أعتقد إنه يعني كوفيد صح it's a bad disease. لكنه يعني كمية ال collaboration الحقيقة between the research centers, between universities and the كمية ال papers اللي اللي طلعت really يعني really هذه تبشر بخير إنه يعني وبعدين يعني أيضا وجود ال CDC CDC Saudi this is this is this is an future step بإذن الله إنه next time we shouldn't take all these you know logistics you know complication we should be you know ahead of of other country in in the clinical trials and the vaccine invention. Thank you. I agree with you, Prof. Fahad. Wakaya, the Saudi CDC played a major role during the pandemic, providing instant, prompt guidelines written for every scenarios or issues being encountered, like COVID cases in the mosque. Like you can have the website and it's full of guidelines, mashallah. And they just started. So, and very well written, evidence based, and so I agree with you. And this is one of the lesson or one of the benefit that we got out of COVID. So if any of our uh, uh, great uh, outstanding speakers can add, please uh, share. Uh. I, uh, I would I'd second uh, what Dr. Fahd mentioned, and I think uh, collaboration is the key. Uh, I think uh, uh, we need to also look at our processes, and I think we should aim high by improving uh, the efficiency of how we uh, we conduct trials, but I think the future is really promising and been great work. And thank you very much for having us here today. Thank you. I agree with you. Collaboration is the key. So, um, Dr. Wali, Dr. Muhammad, do you have anything to uh, to add? Yani, shukran, Dr. Maha. Yani, you being the host added a lot. 
And we cannot end this without thanking you, thanking Dr. Najla, Al Asad Al Fadl, and Ustad Al Aziz, and Dr. Fad, and Dr. Ahmed, and the Kaukab, and the Nukba that are here. Uh, putting all these people together is uh, actually a feat of strength. And uh, like uh, what Dr. Arabi and Dr. Fad said, Al Jaiha Tara. It has its positives, and one of the positives is bringing people together. Shakirin Leki ala al-Stadafa wa ala al-Hosting. You have done a tremendous job, yeah, Doctora. Doctora Najla Allah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, support, and thank you for um, teaching us uh, about the hard work that you and other uh, speakers are doing. We're very proud of all of you. Um, so thank you very much. And Dr. Muhammad, do you want to add? Uh, do you want to say anything? It's really nice to meet uh, you all. Actually, I, I learned a lot, and I would like to thank the organizing committee. Uh, they, these were uh, really precious uh, talks, and uh, uh, thank you, everyone. Inshallah, we'll see you soon when this pandemic is over. over inshallah. inshallah. Thank you very much, Dr. Muhammad. Dr. Maha, actually, I forget to thank you. You were a very nice chairman. I haven't seen such a, a chairman like you. Thank you very Allah much. Allah you. Allah you. Thank 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 you. Um, uh, Dr. Yasin, Prof. Yasin, um, um, thank you all. Um, I hope I didn't uh, forget any name. I believe all my five outstanding speakers, uh, thank you to all the five. Uh, and, and I'm sure uh, I personally learned a lot and I took note of most of your talks. So uh, thank you again. Thank you uh, very much. Jazakumullah khair.
welcome you to the second session um, on medicine against crisis of the knowledge integration virtual forum. My name is Lua Rama. I'm an assistant professor and consultant in public health at King Saudi University and a board member of the Saudi Human Rights Commission. And I'm very excited and honored to chair and moderate this session. There will be four papers presented in today's second session. Each presenter will have 15 minutes uh, for his or her presentation, followed by 15 minutes Q&A after the four presentations. Our first speaker will be presented by Dr. Hamid Bidji, who is an assistant professor at King Saruk and Abdel Aziz University for Health Sciences. He serves as a consultant of pediatric neurology, genetics, and metabolism at King Abdullah Specialized Children's Hospital of the National Guard Health Affairs. He is boarded uh, in pediatric neurology uh, from Canada and McGill University, as well as medical genetics and genomics from Harvard Medical School. He has a fellowship in medical and biomedical genetics from John Hopkins University. Please welcome Dr. Mibbel, who will be presenting his paper titled COVID-19 and Neurological Manifestation, Is It Causal or Coincidental? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, I hope my slides are uh, clear as well as my voice. Please let me know if there are any issues in my uh, in audio or in my slides, please. So, uh, um, since the start of uh, COVID-19, uh, um, we started to see a lot of uh, cases, especially in the Children's Hospital, uh, where there is a lot of patients were screened positive for COVID-19. How some of those could be explained by their neurological phenotype, and some of them actually are completely uh, normal. So the objectives of this talk will be talking about the epidemiology uh, uh, from the uh, uh, most up-to-date uh, references we have, and the importance of this topic. I will share with you five cases that we encountered in our children's hospital in our neurology service at King Abdullah Specialized uh, Children's Hospital. So uh, basically COVID-19 or coronavirus disease 2019 that was uh, first recognized in uh, December 2019 reported in Wuhan, China. It's caused by the uh, novel SARS-2 or the severe acute respiratory syndrome uh, coronavirus 2. The disease was declared by the WHO as a public health emergency of international concern on 30th of January 2020 and as a global pandemic on uh, uh, mid-March uh, of 2020. At the present day, uh, present day uh, cases are increasing as of 14th of November, that's the time when I updated my uh, presentation last, uh, there were about 53 uh, and a half million confirmed cases reported worldwide, with more than 200 countries affected globally. Locally here in Saudi Arabia, we have about 353,000 confirmed cases in Saudi Arabia. Those numbers are taken off from uh, our uh, Ministry of Health. And this includes the total number of cases, including all age groups. So the importance of this topic is that we have a lot of respiratory symptoms as the primary presentation of this disease. Also, there's a group of patients who have some sort of non-specific neurological symptoms, including headache, anosmia or loss of smell, dyskesia, dizziness or lightheadedness, stirred consciousness, and sensory symptoms. Uh, the time with increasing the number of patients with COVID-19 is started to present with neurological manifestations such as cerebrovascular disease or encephalitis, especially in the adult neurology population. We started to see also uh, Guillain-Barre or peripheral neuropathy and Miller-Fisher syndrome in uh, cases uh, in pediatrics. 
Majority of the published COVID-19 cases with the neurological manifestations were mainly reported in adult population. Having said that, there were recent pediatric cases arising uh, in number uh, that are coming uh, to light. To the best of our knowledge, there was only two pediatric cases that are presented with specific neurological manifestations. So basically the objective of our work that we did is to report the COVID-19 pediatric cases were presented with neurological manifestations and to identify the spectrum of manifestations the cases can exhibit. So basically we did a retrospective observational case series. All the pediatric cases infected by SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 were presented with neurological manifestations were collected since May uh, 2020 to June 2030 of 2020. So as you can tell, basically this is on a span of about one month. And this was done at King Abdullah Specialized Children's Hospital in King Abdul Aziz Medical City in Riyadh. So please allow me to share some cases uh, here. So the first case, it was a nine year old boy who was previously healthy, who presented with acute incident of diplopia or double vision dysphagia or difficulty in swallowing, and ataxia or uh, unsteady gait. On his examination, he has doses or droopy eyelids with external ophthalmoplegia and hyporeflexia of upper limbs and areflexia of the lower limbs. He was tested positive for COVID-19 using our standard, which is a nasopharyngeal swab test. He was, his final diagnosis, it was Guillain-Barre syndrome variant, specifically miller fisher syndrome that was confirmed by a neuroimaging which showed thickening and enhancement of the nerve roots of coda equina and conus modularis as well as the presence of gq1b uh, antibodies in, uh, in his csf or cerebrospinal fluid uh, this patient was treated by ivig that was given over five days he improved significantly with uh, uh, better uh, mobilization without assistance so he was discharged home approximately two weeks after his admission. The second case that we have is a 10 year old girl who was previously also healthy, who presented with eye dryness and headache. On her examination, she was found a bilateral papal edema. And this is basically an ominous sign. Whenever we as a neurologist see the sign, this is a, a sign of increased intracranial pressure, including this hyperemia and elevated optic disc. Nasopharyngeal swab test for COVID-19 was also positive. We did for her the neuroimaging, which include the brain MRI that was normal. Her lumbar puncture, it showed an opening a pressure of 22 centimeter water, which is elevated. The cutoff is usually 20 to zero. And her CSF analysis was clear. She was started on acetazolamide at a dose of 15 milligram per kg per day, and she showed significant improvement after that. Uh, uh, the case after that is a six-year-old boy previously healthy presented with acute onset of seizure and history of fever for one week. He was found, he was found to have normal neurological examination. He has a lumbar puncture as a standard of care as we usually do in those children who are presenting with similar symptoms which showed a white cell count of 12 with normal protein and glucose with negative cultures. Once again, this patient showed nasopharyngeal swab test of COVID-19 that was positive. He was uh, given that he has some sort of, uh, of seizure. He was started on anti-seizure medications and he was treated as a case of encephalitis. After significant improvement, once again, he was discharged home. The last case is a 31-month-old boy who was developmentally normally along with neurology as a case of abnormal movement since he was six months of age. And he was planned for admission to complete the investigations, including the EEG and the MRI. However, given our hospital policy during that pandemic, we did a COVID swab testing for him, which came back negative. Thus, this delayed all the investigations and the required workup for this patient. So the patient was sent home although he didn't receive the uh, medical management necessary for him. So in conclusion, our cases highlight that there is a wide spectrum of neurological symptoms in patients with COVID-19, 
And due to the lack of information, it's still about COVID-19 neurological manifestations in pediatrics specifically, we felt there is importance of uh, reporting those cases. And the association between SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 and the neurological presentation with the wide spectrum of manifestations it can exhibit. However, there are more cases that are needed to study this on a higher, uh, uh, a higher measuring uh, scale. Another point that I want that highlighted through our cases is that uh, this affected our practice and the standard of care for the patients during the pandemic of COVID-19, where some patients who required some investigations and admission, uh, it was delayed, uh, which will uh, which affected their diagnosis and their necessary treatment. With this, I am gonna stop here and I am open to receive any questions. Thank you, Dr. Mikdal. So our next uh, presenter is Dr. Iman Al-Mansour, uh, who is an assistant uh, professor at the Department of Epidemic Diseases Research at uh, IRMC uh, uh, Imam Abdurrahman Ben Faisal University. Uh, Al-Mansour is also an academic member at the European Virus Bioinformatics Center in Germany. Um, she earned her PhD in Biomedical Engineering and Biotechnology from the University of Massachusetts. And uh, her primary research is focused on the development of nucleic acid vaccines, NAVs, against emerging and re-emerging viruses. Also, Al-Mansour has developed uh, NAVs candidates against SARS-CoV-2, MERS-CoV, and H1N1 influenza. She's interested uh, in applying compu computational methods for monitoring vir virus evolution, virus immune surveillance, and rational vaccine design. She's the principal investigator on several research grants and, and, and projects. She recently founded virus bioinformatics resources, uh, including the uh, coronaviruses. Please welcome Dr. Mansour, who will be presenting her, her paper titled Development of a Prophylactic Nucleic Acid Vaccine Against SARS-CoV-2. Hello everyone, could you hear my voice now? Yes, we can hear you. So I just would like to make sure if you are able to see my slide. Uh, yes, if, if you can open it again. Uh, if you could share it uh, on your side, please, Mr. Mohammed. Okay, yeah, I, I will share it from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I would like to thank the Ministry of Education for their invitation to participate in this important event. My talk for today will focus on our uh, preclinical study for the plasma DNA vaccine towards COVID 19. Next, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so in this presentation, I will highlight the virology and the immunology of the coronaviruses, and I will give some background on the vaccine types, 
And I will uh, demonstrate our preclinical study on the plasma DNA vaccine. And I will highlight some of our virus bioinformatic resources and give some recognition. Next slide, please. OK, so as in all coronaviruses, uh, there are certain uh, structural proteins that include the spike, matrix, and envelope, and the nucleocapsid. The N protein is known as the most abundant protein in coronaviruses, while the S is considered the most, uh, the second most abundant. Uh, both S and N proteins uh, can elicit antibody-mediated responses. However, only S uh, protein can neutralize uh, SARS-CoV-2, which makes it of a particular interest during vaccine uh, development. Next slide, please. So the gene construct we used in our vaccine uh, was the spike gene. Uh, the spike protein is known as the homotrimeric uh, glycoprotein, and each of the spike monomer consists of S1 and S2 subunits. This S1 subunit contains the receptor binding domain, which are important to bind to the host cell receptor through the ACA2 um, receptor on the host cell, while the S2 is important for virus suffusion since it includes essential elements like the fusion peptide, the uh, transmembrane domain, and the cytoplasmic. Next slide, please. Here I'm highlighting uh, some of the major vaccine platforms, which include the classical vaccines, the subunit vaccines, uh, the viral vectors, and the nucleic acid-based vaccine. Our vaccine platform is considered among the nucleic acid-based vaccine, which is the plasma DNA vaccine. The nucleic acid-based vaccines includes key major advantages over those conventional vaccines, and these include its ability to elicit both humoral and cellular immune responses. It can be produced uh, very fast, and it has high safety profile. Next slide, please. So here, uh, during vaccine synthesis, we have bioinformatically optimized these genes constructs. So um, we included actually two uh, vaccine uh, constructs, the one that is coding the full length S and the other one that includes the S1 gene. And uh, to enhance our uh, plasma DNA uh, transcription and translation upon immunization, we have done several optimization. These include the optimization to mammalian carbon preference. Uh, this includes the homo sapien in particular, and then other optimization like the GC content, the mRNA secondary structures, and other optimizations were included. Additional um, uh, fragments were added also to enhance the translation efficiency. And then those um, constructs were de novo synthesized and were confirmed by sequencing and then through restriction analysis to make sure we have the correct gene sequence with the correct uh, gene set. Uh, next slide. So currently, there is limited data on the doses that are required to generate long-lasting immunity. And the previous research have determined that the um, vaccine, uh, the antigen type, and the virus type is dependent on those doses. So in plasma DNA vaccine, one to two doses of uh, plasma DNA vaccine is sufficient to produce neutralizing antibody responses in influenza H1N1, while three to four doses are needed to elicit sufficient responses in HIV virus. Next slide, please. So here, uh, I'm illustrating our previous study on the uh, seasonal and pandemic H1N1 influenza. And we have used the plasma DNA vaccine platform for our study. Uh, these uh, vaccine technology have been used in our uh, current vaccine study on the COVID-19. Uh, next slide, please. So here, um, we have done uh, animal immunization uh, using, uh, we have divided actually the animals into seven groups. 
And those uh, animals have received either the S4 length or the S1 um, codon optimized plasma DNA vaccine. Um, each of those um, mice have received 100 microgram. And then um, the mice also, uh, for each immunization, the, uh, the serum sample were taken prior of first immunization and then two weeks uh, after uh, each immunization. So some of those um, mice have received three doses while others received four doses. Next slide, please. So here I'm illustrating one of the immunological studies that we have used. And this is the uh, ELISA study for measurement of binding antibodies. So overall, all immunized mice to the groups except the PBS uh, group have demonstrated detectable levels of antibodies. And the uh, DNA vaccine that includes the full-length spike gene uh, have elicited the most uh, high level or high titer of antibody responses compared to other uh, vaccine constructs. Uh, next slide, please. So here with the S1 vaccine platform, we have demonstrated um, a detectable level of antibodies that is in a moderate uh, level. Next slide, please. We have uh, used a, 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 next slide, please. Okay. And here we have used a heterologous prime and boost vaccination, and we have seen um, an improvement of antibody titers upon receiving fourth dose. Next slide, this slide, please. Okay, in addition to our uh, work in um, vaccine, we're also interested in monitoring the genetic and antigenetic uh, mutations in those viruses. This is, becomes of particular importance during vaccine synthesis to determine if there is any immune evasion, which essentially needs to uh, replace a current vaccine or doing some improvement on the vaccines. So we have done previously um, a database to track some of the uh, known viruses that cause some outbreaks and certain epidemics, like the measles, mumber, rubella. We have also developed another database uh, to uh, rationally design an effective vaccine, um, which includes the 15 um, viruses family. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So uh, you can log in through these uh, websites and uh, these are user-friendly website to um, be used. And then in a continuation to our work uh, for those bioinformatic resources, we have developed a third database for the human coronaviruses. Next slide, please. So uh, we have recently developed the Human Coronaviruses Database, which is a comprehensive, up-to-date uh, database that includes the genetic and proteomic database for the three highly pathogenic viruses. This includes SARS, uh, MERS, and then SARS-CoV-2. And this uh, database includes a user-friendly interface and other computational tools for the customized search. Uh, next slide, please. So the coronavirus uh, resources, it's a meta database for the SARS, MERS, and SARS-CoV-2. Um, also, the availability of standalone tools like the Cluster Omega, BLAST, and GeoChart, which can, uh, be, uh, which can perform for larger scale bioinformatic analysis. Also, uh, we have integrated the predefined antigenic epitopes. This includes T cell and B cell. Uh, epitopes to determine the patterns of conservation or variation within a virus and across those three viruses. Next slide, please. So here is some screenshots of the uh, user interface where uh, the, the researcher could um, use this database to retrieve some information, uh, doing some blast search or um, doing some in-house uh, uh, computational analysis. Next slide, please. So we have seen all that the development of COVID-19 vaccine is uh, ongoing on, under uh, unprecedented rate. And, but the long-term efficacy of COVID-19 vaccine remains a high concern. 
Um, it has been suggested that multiple doses for COVID-19 is highly needed, especially at a uh, uh, high age group. Um, in addition, the development of bioinformatic databases and tools are essential to monitor any uh, antigenic mutation, which is highly crucial in the case of SARS-CoV-2 or any other emerging or re-emerging viruses. Next, please. At the end, I would like to thank um, all of the contributors in this project for the COVID-19, uh, uh, my lab group, the Animal House facility, and for the kindly um, uh, receiving the uh, mice for this study. I would like also to thank uh, the co-investigator, Dr. Inan Dilewa, for the, uh, being part of the uh, Human Coronaviruses Database, which is also funded by CAPS. And with this slide, this slide, I would like to stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mansour. Our next uh, presenter is Dr. Fatima Atman, who's an assistant professor of epidemiology at King Saud bin Abdul Aziz University for Health Sciences. She obtained her uh, bachelor degree uh, on medicine and surgery from Taiba University and uh, had her master's and PhD in epidemiology and public health from University of Nottingham in the UK. Dr. Uthman's research is primarily focused on respiratory epidemiology and in case of ventilation complications among critical care patients with experience in secondary analysis of large data. Please welcome Dr. Uthman, who will be presenting her paper titled Severe COVID-19 in Intensive Care and the Role of Invasive Ventilation, a Proportion Meta-Analysis. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, shukran, uh, Doctora, for this uh, nice uh, 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 introduction. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizing committee for giving us this opportunity to participate in this uh, great forum. Uh, in upcoming minutes, I'm going to share with you the area of research that we carried out to focus on examining the severe COVID-19 uh, in intensive care and the role of in, uh, invasive ventilation uh, in uh, severity of COVID-19. So uh, the outline of this presentation will be as follow, uh, which I will going to start with highlighting the importance of understanding the risk of developing a severe clinical manifestation of COVID-19 that required admission to um, ICU and mechanical ventilation initiation. And then I'm going to follow by a brief summary about the methods and the main result of this uh, meta-analysis. And at the end, uh, the challenging and the limitation of that we usually face during uh, carrying out a meta-analysis study during this pandemic. So uh, COVID-19 pandemic has affected the healthcare sector in all nations around the world. Uh, country until now still facing this epidemic disease and great effort are still needed to understand its uh, epidemiology, uh, clinical presentation, uh, pathological manifestation, and the appropriate technique needed for the management of the infected case. Uh, one critical aspect that also needs to be addressed is the severity of COVID-19 infection associated with the evolution of this um, emerging uh, epidemic. So we can examine uh, the severity of uh, COVID-19 by estimating the proportion of patients who needed ICU admission and initiation of mechanical uh, ventilation. So as, as everybody knows that the clinical spectrum of COVID-19 is varied and it has been explored in many studies. Um, uh, current research has indicated that older ad adults, uh, mainly those who had underlying health condition, were at high risk for severe COVID-19 illness. Uh, some of those studies have uh, measured or used uh, mortality as indicator to measure the extent of COVID-19 severity. However, some, uh, there is a few studies that have used uh, admission of ICU and the need of mechanical ventilation uh, to estimate the likelihood of developing severe COVID-19 complication. So the rate of ICU admission at the beginning of this epidemic was varied between uh, countries and little study at the beginning of this outbreak have reported the percentage of ICU admitted patients who required invasive ventilation. 
so estimating or by estimating the proportion of those patients will help to understand the epidemiological determinant of those risks, uh, which will also uh, help us to uh, correctly assess the clinical burden of COVID-19. Uh, another thing that which is, I think it's an important aspect uh, to think about and to consider it is the, uh, the effect of national response in any country uh, is the capacity of the healthcare system to cope with uh, the necessary resource in, in, in a time in, uh, in, in time manner or in very uh, limited uh, time frame. So by quantifying the extent of the risk of ICU admission, uh, we will allow governments and healthcare organization to cope with the rapidly increasing demand of ventilator uh, in intensive care unit. So the main objective of this study was to uh, assess the proportion of ICU admitted patients among uh, confirmed cases with uh, um, COVID-19 and to uh, quantify the number of patients who required invasive uh, mechanical ventilation. So for the method uh, that we have uh, carried out, so we carried out a proportional meta-analysis uh, that have been uh, uh, conducted in uh, adherence with the um, uh, Prisma statement. So uh, we look for observational study that have been published in uh, many uh, uh, different electronic database, including Midline, Web of Science, Clovis uh, electronic databases until the April of 2020, at which is the beginning of the uh, COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, eligible study were, uh, were case series, uh, case control studies, cohort study, and case report. Uh, if, the, if the sample size more than five uh, patients, that that been included as eligible study. Uh, however, review articles, editorial article, and surveillance reports uh, which did not present original data were excluded, and we applied language restriction. Uh, the full text of those potentially relevant articles were, were assessed at initially and uh, according to the outcome that we are looking for. So basically the outcome, uh, the primary outcome that we are looking for is uh, confirmed cases of COVID-19 and documented uh, data on proportion of patients who've been admitted to ICU and the patient undergoing uh, mechanical ventilation. We also collect information regarding mortality and uh, some other demographic factors related for those uh, uh, patients. Uh, we also assess the risk of bias using a scoring system, using a, a quality assessment tool uh, from national institutional health. So uh, from December 19 until 2000, uh, April 2020, around 23 articles have been included with the uh, estimated uh, population of 6,100 uh, uh, patients that have been included in uh, in our meta analysis, so the uh, the the in brief the the uh, the result of our study showed that uh, the proportion of all hospitalized patients with, confir with confirmed uh, COVID-19 who required uh, ICU admission was 18 uh, percent, uh, wherein the patient, uh, the, the estimate proportion of ICU patients who required or who are being placed on invasive ventilation uh, was around 34 percent. And if we look Mainly to those study who are included only in ICU patient, we can uh, we 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 found that estimated around uh, uh, sixty nine percent of those patients. So if we're going looking for the first plot for those uh, for those prevalence, we can see that around among all study around seventy four percent of uh, patients who have confirmed uh, COVID nineteen have required ICU admission. Uh, around uh, eighteen percent who have been from all the hospitalized patient and if looking for those ICU patients, we can find that around 69% of those patients required uh, and using of or being placed on invasive uh, mechanical ventilation. And if we combine both uh, uh, all, observe, all hospitalized patients and all ICU patients, uh, the percentage of uh, 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 percentage of uh, IC requiring mechanical ventilation is uh, 31%. Uh, for mortality uh, for, of all cases who required ICU admission, it was 34% in comparison of overall mortality for all hospitalized patients, which was 30%. Uh, for age and gender distribution in relation to the ICU admission, uh, the, uh, uh, of those studies which only included ICU population, the overall mean age of, the, of those patients with confirmed and uh, COVID-19 was uh, 75 years 
uh, old, and 37% uh, were female patients. So uh, in, in, in this study, we try to, to, um, to initially summarize the clinical data on confirmed 19 cases during the first four months of the outbreak. And we found that 80% of hospitalized patients with confirmed COVID required ICU admission, 14% uh, of those hospitalized patients required intensive ventilation, and 67% of those patients who are required uh, ICU uh, patients required uh, invasive uh, uh, ventilation. So from clinical or, or critical care perspective, uh, the estimation number of those patients who required uh, mechanical ventilation and invasive ventilation is very crucial. Uh, this can help healthcare authorities uh, to predict the number of expected cases that will require invasive ventilation in terms of allocating resource. Uh, however, there is still need for more studies that include uh, cohort follow-up of those ICU-admitted patients in order to determine the clinical outcome uh, in terms of um, invasive ventilation ventilation requirement. So the main challenging that I, I do believe uh, that uh, most of the published meta-analysis uh, uh, facing or, or in, in publishing of those uh, or in, in trying to conduct a meta-analysis of uh, the published article that have been published in, in prognosis and comorbidity of uh, uh, COVID-19 is the number of, uh, of, of published articles uh, from different countries and which is sometimes make it difficult to cope with such huge number of publications. In addition, the individual identification information of the patient who have been involved in those uh, published studies uh, is absent. That can lead for overestimation of the total number of, of the bold analysis, and that will happen, I think, in, in our research. Uh, and, and that is uh, uh, and that risk especially uh, have been highlighted in, in because of most of the study that have been published in early was from uh, China and uh, have been collected during the same period. So it's just to be careful in interpreting those uh, results. So at, at the end, uh, around fifth of the patients who are infected with COVID-19 required admission to ICU, uh, at least a third of those patients need uh, intensive uh, mechanical ventilation. Still, there is a need for additional research uh, with uh, careful study design to identify predictor and um, pathogenesis of uh, severe cases. Now we are in second stage of conducting another meta-analysis of patients who have been uh, only uh, uh, admitted to ICU and uh, to examine the type and, and the mood of the invasive ventilation that have been used in during uh, those uh, setting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rathman. Our next uh, presenter is Dr. Mahmoud. Qandil Sayyid, uh, who is an Associate Professor of Pharmacology at King Faisal University. He received his PhD from Japan in Biomolecular Sciences. His main expertise is related to drug discovery research. His major focus is on the discovery of new antimicrobial agents by targeting proteins and enzymes in microorganisms in the field of coronavirus. Um, coronavirus. He has about 14 publications, five articles on COVID-19, and two pending patent files for MERS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2 inhibitors. Please welcome Dr. Sayed, who will be presenting his paper titled Discovery of New Antiviral Drug Against SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV. <laughs> Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, at first, I would like to thank the uh, organizing committee for uh, inviting us for this uh, uh, important event. Uh, my uh, presentation today is, uh, is about uh, our efforts to uh, discover and uh, introduce uh, new drugs for treatment of uh, SARS coronavirus 2 and the MERS coronavirus. Uh, as we all know, SARS, uh, SARS coronavirus 2 is a positive agent of COVID-19. And the MERS coronavirus is a positive agent of the Middle East uh, associated respiratory syndrome uh, uh, virus. Uh, and here we, uh, at first, uh, I have to comment that uh, uh, both viruses or um, uh, uh, SARS, SARS coronavirus 2 and the MERS coronavirus were not the first epidemic that faced, faced the human beings, and they also they. They were not the uh, uh, one of the strongest epidemics that affected the, uh, <laughs> the human beings. And here I, I will uh, just mention a few past uh, uh, diseases or epidemics that greatly affect 
the life of uh, human beings. For example, in uh, the year uh, 165 and throughout the 15 years, uh, uh, about 40% of uh, population in Europe, West Asia, and the North Africa were dead from smallpox. Uh, other example in uh, uh, 1545 uh, uh, and throughout three years, about 80% 80 of Mexicans uh, were dead in three years due to uh, a disease called uh, uh, hemorrhagic fever. And also during the uh, uh, 1645, 70% uh, of people in Europe were dead within three years due to plague. And more recently, and uh, from about 100 years ago, and uh, in 1918, more than 60 million of people worldwide were dead from the pandemic influenza. Uh, uh, after this date, and in 1927, uh, this be, be regarded as lucky year for the life of, uh, of uh, <laughs> human beings. In uh, 1927, uh, the, uh, the first drug which is used for chemotherapy uh, against uh, bacterial diseases was uh, discovered. And from this date on, from 1927, many, many of the chemotherapeutic drugs were discovered. And many of these were used to control the infection with uh, uh, viral or bacterial or uh, parasitic diseases. And uh, after this date, we noticed that the uh, stress of uh, 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 diseases were uh, less less uh, than before, and their control become improved by the uh, uh, introduction of the science of uh, drug discovery and the discovery of uh, new drugs. Uh, also, uh, uh, I have to comment that uh, many people or some of our researchers believe that viral diseases are without treatment, or the viruses has no treatment, and this is certainly not true. We can manage the viral infection, and we can uh, develop new drugs. And there are uh, uh, tens or hundreds of drugs uh, approved by the Food and the Drug uh, Administration, or the FDA, for the treatment of viral diseases. And in this photo, I will show some examples with the mechanisms which we can use to uh, develop new drugs against the viruses. And we can here see we can interfere with the virus attachment with the uh, cells. We can interfere with the fusion of the viral and the cell membrane. And this is an uh, important step in the uh, infection cycle of the virus. If the virus is able to attach and diffuse to the uh, cell membrane, uh, it will be able to uh, uh, introduce his uh, genetic material uh, into the cells and begin the, uh, the cycle of infection. We can then interfere with the virus attachment. We can interfere with the virus fusion with the cell membrane. We can, after this, interfere with, with the replication of the uh, nucleic acids of the virus, either, either DNA or, or RNA. We can interfere with the protein synthesis of the virus. We can uh, interfere with the virus assembly. We can also interfere, interfere with the uh, release of virus. So we have several steps, and the, uh, uh, there are more other steps that we can use to interfere with the life of the virus or, or the life cycle uh, of the virus. And there are many drug targets that we can use for development of new uh, antiviral drugs. In this uh, presentation and in the next few, uh, few slides, we will focus on our efforts in uh, development of fusion uh, inhibitors or the drugs that inhibit the fusion of the uh, viral membrane with the uh, uh, cell membrane. And so uh, this mechanism can be used for prophylaxis and the treatment of viral diseases. Uh, uh, as we see here, uh, just I will uh, uh, comment on the interface between the viral membrane and the cell membrane or the viral envelope and the uh, cell membrane. This photo is at a certain step uh, at the uh, fusion uh, state be between the virus and the cell membrane. Uh, we here we focus uh, uh, our target or our effort to develop the drug by uh, investigation of this interface between the viral and the cell membrane. Uh, 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 at certain step of uh, fusion process, the S2 subunit or part of the spike of the virus become in contact or become 
in uh, 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 binding with the uh, uh, host, host cell membrane. And we focus here in two important proteins at the interface between the virus and the cell membrane. Uh, uh, please take note of uh, the, the names of these two proteins because this will be the, uh, uh, our, fo uh, our focus in the next slide. These two proteins, what is called uh, HR1 and what's called HR2, they are part of the interface between the uh, um, uh, viral membrane and the uh, host cell membrane. Uh, these two targets are, are very important for, uh, for our next slides and, and very important for uh, our drug discovery work. And we have to uh, comment that uh, uh, um, uh, to start the fusion process, the viral membrane must come in, in uh, close contact with the host cell membrane as a part of the fusion process. This will come only after the HR2 domain, this one in red, will move down at the end bind to a certain cavity on the surface of HR1. If HR2 domain is able to move from its position and bind to a certain cavity on the, on the surface of HR1, it will bring the viral membrane and host membrane to become in contact in each other and uh, start the fusion between the viral and the cell membrane. So simply our target or uh, our target in this uh, <laughs> presentation to show you how we try to uh, <laughs> inhibit the process of fusion between the HR2 and the uh, HR1. If we are able to uh, prevent this process, so we will be able to prevent the virus fusion or, or the fusion between the, the membrane of the virus and the membrane of the host. Uh, as we see here, we, we adopted two strategies, either by a small molecule or just a small chemical mo uh, molecule or by using short peptides. We tried the small molecules and the short peptides that, that are able to bind to the uh, surface cavity on the surface of HR1 and they prevent the attachment of HR2 to each binding site on the surface of HR1 and then after that it will prevent the uh, fusion process and it can be used as a tool for uh, prophylaxis and the treatment. Uh, 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 at first we uh, investigated the uh, uh, interface between uh, uh, HR1 and the HR2 and uh, uh, we can see in this photo uh, that the uh, HR, uh, HR1 is uh, displayed in, uh, in uh, cartoon or surface representation and the HR2 is rep uh, represented in red uh, uh, coil uh, and, uh, as we see that uh, red helix is this one uh, and then we investigated the cavity in which the HR2 is placed on the surface of HR1. We investigated this cavity, uh, as you see here, uh, this cavity was uh, investigated, and we started the process of searching and the design of, a, of a small uh, molecules or uh, chemical compounds that can fit or fill this cavity, and also investigated to uh, uh, synthesize and make small short peptides, uh, similar in the structure to the, the uh, this helix of uh, HR2, and we tried to uh, uh, develop more potent peptides and more potent small <laughs> molecules that are able to compete with HR2 to its binding site on HR1. Uh, we, if we are able to succeed in this process, so we will prevent the uh, HR2 from coming into this, uh, this uh, surface cavity on the uh, HR1 and then we will be able to <laughs> prevent the virus fusion process with cell membrane. Uh, at first, we uh, tried the libraries of millions of, uh, of uh, compounds by looking at the computational studies. And uh, after these studies, we selected uh, about 88 compounds that showed very strong uh, interaction with the, with the uh, HR2 cavity. Uh, and these 88 uh, compounds were selected and then examined uh, in the antiviral assays by cell-cell uh, uh, fusion assays and the virus replication assays. Uh, here we can see the results of uh, 88 compounds uh, that were selected from the previous step on the virus uh, uh, spike-mediated cell-cell-mediated uh, uh, fusion. And we were able here to find 
uh, different ac uh, activities of uh, different compounds, but there, are, uh, there were about 15 compounds that showed uh, high, uh, uh, high effect in the prevention of uh, the MERS coronavirus membrane fusion with the host cell membrane. Uh, then after that, we took these uh, 15 compounds which show a uh, good effect and the prevention of uh, MERS coronavirus cell cell fusion, and we tested this compound on the uh, MERS coronavirus uh, replication. And we found that all compounds were able to uh, decrease the fusion of the MERS coronavirus with cell membrane within the range of 40 to 60 percent. Uh, and we selected uh, two, uh, two of the most important compounds, and uh, we make uh, uh, what is called IC50. We tried to uh, identify the potency of these compounds in uh, inhibition of MERS coronavirus virus replication, and we were able to find that these compounds were able to prevent MERS coronavirus replication at the uh, low micromolar range. Uh, then, uh, then after that, uh, as we said, we uh, we tried to uh, uh, design and synthesize uh, a set of uh, peptides, small peptides. They, uh, they are about uh, 36 amino acids in length, and these peptides uh, were uh, designed in uh, a form that it can be more stronger than the wild type uh, HR, HR2 and binding to its cavity on HR1. So we made some mutations in the wild type HR2 and uh, analyzed uh, the uh, binding strength of, of each mutant with the surface of HR1. <clears throat> Uh, and when we uh, and then we we suggested about 11 peptides with favorable mutations and stronger uh, binding with the with the HR1. These uh, peptides were then tested in the assays of uh, MERS coronavirus cell cell fusion and also in the assays of MERS coronavirus replication. And we found that uh, all these peptides were very strong in inhibition of MERS coronavirus membrane fusion and they were potent in the nanomolar range. Uh, and uh, if we compare the, the results of uh, peptides and the small molecules, we find that the peptides are more stronger than small molecules in prevention of MERS coronavirus fusion. The uh, small molecules were almost effective in the low uh, micromolar range. However, the peptides were very strong in the nanomolar range. And this set of peptides are now subject for patent application. Um, uh, as we see here, we uh, tested the effect of uh, peptides on MERS coronavirus replication. And as we, as we see here, we have three peptides at micromolar uh, range. Uh, we're able to uh, prevent the MERS, MERS coronavirus plaques formation uh, for about 90%, more than 90% of plaques were uh, prevented. Then after that, we make a detailed experiment to know the potency of these peptides. We just only selected the top uh, top three uh, uh, peptides, and we find we found that uh, these uh, three peptides were very potent in the inhibition of MERS coronavirus replication. And as we see here, this is this is the uh, 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 MERS coronavirus without any treatment, and by addition of different concentration of the peptide. We uh, noticed that the peptides completely prevented the replication of MERS, uh, MERS coronavirus. The potency of these three, uh, three peptides were uh, very low in the micromolar uh, range. They were 1.4, 1.8, and the number four, uh, the peptide number four, were the most potent in the nanomolar range and was 0 0.3. And uh, these three peptides are now subject for uh, uh, patent uh, examination. Uh, uh, by the same strategy, we, we tried to uh, develop a small molecule and uh, 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 HR2 uh, peptide analogs for, uh, for, SARS, for, for SARS coronavirus 2 or for COVID-19. We used the same strategy, uh, but here, because the SARS coronavirus 2 was a very recent infection, we, we, we made several changes in the structure of uh, HR2 of uh, COVID. We also tried different lenses of, uh, and the different compositions and the sequences of uh, HR2 of uh, COVID. And we designed a set of 12 peptides. Uh, as we, as we uh, uh, told you before, 
that this peptide the design process depend on the uh, production of mutants that were able to bind strongly with the HR1 or part of the protein of the HR1 and, and able to compete with the binding of uh, uh, HR2 and to prevent the virus fusion. And here, uh, after examination of this new set of peptides for, uh, for COVID, we were also able to uh, <laughs> prevent the fusion between uh, uh, COVID membranes with, with, uh, with host cell membranes. And also, we were able to uh, prevent the replication of a COVID virus in the nanomolar range. This set also um, uh, is uh, uh, subject for patent application for uh, examination for possible uh, COVID agents. Uh, 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 <laughs> finally, in conclusion, we can say that we were able to discover new fusion uh, inhibitors or drugs that can prevent the fusion of MERS coronavirus and the SARS coronavirus 2 with the host cell membranes. And these uh, peptides inhibited the cell cell fusion and the virus replication. Uh, these peptides were examined to be safe uh, for, uh, for uh, host cells without any side effect or cytotoxicity. These peptides are now uh, under, uh, undergoing examination in uh, lab animals experiments. We hope in the future that we can find the support to uh, this peptides on uh, uh, infected human cases. Uh, finally, uh, I would like to thank our uh, um, uh, uh, professors and the collaborator labs from uh, Tokyo University of Japan and uh, for uh, and from the um, uh, College of Medicine uh, Halaim uh, University from Korea. And we thank you all for listening. And we hope uh, if I can get some questions. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Basayi. Uh, so I'm sure that um, um, after the simulated presentations, um, uh, the audience uh, would like to ask some questions or comments on, on some of the points uh, presented uh, uh, today. And we've received a few questions uh, for Dr. Fatma Atman. Um, we have this question for you. Um, someone uh, might argue that the uh, variety of enrolled studies in this meta-analysis uh, is a major source of concern uh, because of the variation in, um, in the rates of mechanical ventilation. So first, is it uh, really a source of concern? And if yes, um, what are your suggested uh, solutions for this, either uh, uh, methodology or otherwise? If you can unmute yourself, it's a Fatma. You hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah. So thank you for uh, for this uh, question. So uh, in, uh, in for us to under to be able to understand the epidemiological manifestation of the CV severity of COVID nineteen patients, uh, uh, we need to, to to rely on the published study that have been published in that field, and to have a detailed information related to the mode of invasive ventilation that have been used, uh, the, the the outcome and following the, the following up of those uh, patients who have been placed on. Uh, uh, the mechanical ventilation. So uh, yes, it's considered as a concern. Uh, however, uh, we are, as I mentioned, we are uh, now carrying out uh, another study that will look in depth for those patients uh, who have been uh, placed on mechanical ventilation uh, among uh, ICU admitted patients. Thank you, Dr. Fatma. We have another question as well um, on, on your presentation. Uh, so this meta-analysis is um, uh, obviously a, um, uh, an important part for evidence-based uh, medicine or evidence-based even public health practice. What would, you, what would uh, uh, be your recommendations for the healthcare decision uh, maker, uh, makers regarding the risks, uh, um, risk factors for the ICU admissions and, the, um, uh, and their outcomes? 
so uh, it will be very uh, benefit if we have a common registry for all those patients who have been admitted uh, to ICU and the, all immunological data uh, for for those patients uh, if that have been carried for 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 example in geographical area uh, uh, that will avoid different uh, uh, including of different patients in different study in the same uh, bold analysis so if if it, if it can we have a, a joint uh, uh, registry in a specific uh, area that will help uh, uh, a researcher in many institutions, in many academic uh, institutions, to uh, carry out more in-depth research uh, related to uh, uh, the severity of uh, COVID-19, as well as to uh, set a predictor and score of, uh, of uh, mortality among those patients who have been uh, uh, placed on uh, invasive ventilation. Actually, I think that's a, that's a great initiative um, that we can take forward with, the, uh, with this uh, um, uh, forum, um, having registries uh, around COVID-19 along the, the continuum um, of care. So uh, I, can't, I can't agree more. Uh, Dr. Sayed, uh, we have a, um, a question for you. Yes, yes. So, um, uh, are there any FDA approved uh, peptide drugs for the treatment of um, uh, viral diseases? And if, uh, uh, and if we do have them, would they work for COVID-19? Uh, yes, for COVID-19, uh, still until now, there is no uh, uh, approved drugs for application. But uh, there are several drugs for antiviral diseases that were approved by FDA. And specifically for uh, uh, peptide drugs, there, there is one drug for treatment of HIV or AIDS. Uh, this drug is, is called uh, infovertide or fusion. Uh, this drug is based on peptides, uh, and this drug can be used for treatment of AIDS and approved by uh, FDA. That's, um, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, good news because I think, as you heard, now in the um, in the news, the vaccine is under the spotlight, uh, but uh, people are asking also for treatments and uh, uh, ther therapeutics. Um, and as you remember, at the beginning of this pandemic, people were brought uh, they brought up a few um, uh, treatments uh, for other viral illnesses, and they said, would they actually work for for COVID nineteen? So this is um, this is helpful to know that we actually. Um, there are some, but they might not uh, work uh, for COVID at least now. Yes, so I think it's uh, go ahead, Dr. Say. Yes, uh, 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 most drugs used for COVID now, uh, what is called uh, either repurposed from the previous experience of other diseases from the SARS and the MERS. Uh, physicians who were working with uh, <laughs> cases in the SARS and the MERS. Uh, we're uh, report, uh, repurposing their uh, use the protocol in the, in the treatment of uh, COVID. But till now, there is no specific anti-COVID drugs which was discovered specifically for uh, uh, COVID. Uh, I, so uh, our trial and the many people uh, around the world are also working for the treatment of the drug. And uh, we have reached a set of new trials and we, uh, we are trying now to make some uh, uh, examination of this uh, peptides and uh, real uh, cases of uh, COVID infection. And we hope in the near future we can reach a good, uh, good therapeutic choices. And as, uh, as I said now, uh, uh, there are some approved peptides for treatment of other viral diseases such as AIDS and approved by uh, FDA. Uh, and we hope also if we can uh, uh, develop the based on the peptide. I also have to comment that um, uh, peptides are uh, very effective in, in, in the very low concentrations, at, at concentrations much, much lower than the small molecules of uh, chemicals. Uh, and uh, this uh, this may be good the advantage of them. Uh, we can use the peptides that are <laughs> inhibitors of the virus replication at very low concentration. And we hope in the near future we can test this peptide in, uh, in what is called the clinical trials or approve the, 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 the efficiency of these peptides in infected cases. We hope this is Thank you very much, Dr. Sayed. Thank you very much. So, um, 
our audience, ladies and gentlemen, um, as Dr. Sayed mentioned in his presentation today, this is not the first and definitely it won't be our last pandemic we're going to face. Uh, we need to continue to look closely uh, at emerging or potentially emerging health threats, reflecting, building on lessons learned. The presented papers today highlighted the spectrum of, uh, of efforts trying to understand the role of medicine against emerging diseases. Treatments, vaccines, clinical presentations, outcomes, and translation and evidence-based research. Hence the need for this um, inter integration uh, um, uh, of all these understandings and hence this forum. I would like to thank the organizing team of the Knowledge uh, Integration Virtual Forum for their great efforts, our presenters for their stimulating scientific papers, and the participants for their valuable uh, questions and, and discussion. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.